advanced learning, connecting dots and beyond, because of course we are trying to uh, wrap up and, and take some uh, ideas forward throughout the, the, that we had experienced throughout the two years of the project and uh, through the engagement of you and the, the enlarge the digital enhanced learning community. So the agenda of today after my brief introduction uh, will uh, open with the keynote address from Reana schwininger ladak uh, from the European Commission. She is the head of view of the unit Interactive Technologies Digital for Culture and Education. And she will start uh, uh, with uh, setting the, the frame, if you want, uh, from a policy and, and, uh, and situation point of view of the digital announced learning uh, um, current current uh, uh, current topics we will then go on with a high profile panel mo moderated by my colleague Alex Tresh from the 3CL foundation and then uh, after a short break we will also have a series of uh, uh, thematic presentations on uh, uh, important uh, topics that throughout the project and the interaction with you we have uh, we have uh, um, uh, analyzed and and uh, elaborated upon. So just quickly to present the project, the original ambition was to help uh, the European Commission and the uh, digital enhanced learning community at large to develop a unified strategy uh, that would go hand in hand with the wider digital transformation. And now I would even say twin transformation, twin uh, transition, because uh, uh, in the last uh, years, the digital transformation got really tightly coupled with the green and, uh, and uh, sustainable uh, transformation of the European, uh, not only education, but society at large. Originally, the project had uh, three objectives. To, uh, one is to create a solid knowledge base uh, by gathering uh, input from, from the relevant community actors, and then develop this into a collaborative and sustainable ecosystem. And last but not least, to look forward and define a strategic agenda that covers both research topics, advanced technologies, but also uh, policy and social uh, impact uh, recommendations. So from the first objective, we have two main project results that we will uh, present and discuss with you uh, later in the, in the day. Uh, the first one is uh, a map, a matrix uh, to connect the various technology uh, opportunities, the various technology techniques and, and their affordances with the pedagogical context in which they can be used for different educational goals. The second aspect that we include in the knowledge base and we will, uh, we will uh, cover today is uh, a collection of uh, best practices and best practice patterns and, and, and uh, let's say recipes as well uh, uh, um, that belong to the, to the digital enhanced learning. On the forward-looking agenda, as I said, we, uh, the, the project uh, through engagement with, uh, with the several stakeholders in, in, the, in the community uh, now produced uh, one uh, uh, result more focused on research agenda. So what are the challenges? What are the research topics and strategic priorities that have been uh, uh, highlighted uh, by, by our, by our uh, our uh, experts and, and the people that we, that we engage with. And the other one is uh, more towards uh, policy and uh, uh, strategic direction recommendations. And this we will uh, also cover later. But of course, the first step will be to hear our, our keynote on, this, on these topics. Of course, uh, um, extremely important uh, factor during the lifetime of the project and more has been the uh, transformation and, and the shock first and transformation adaptation later of the education world uh, because of the uh, COVID pandemic that changed uh, uh, and limited first and changed then uh, how the education is, uh, is um, uh, delivered and what uh, uh, are the expectations for this. Uh, the last, uh, obviously, the, the last uh, goal is to create a sustainable ecosystem by engaging the community of, uh, of digital enhanced learning through various channels. Now, uh, I don't know uh, if I think it's possible to, to have uh, in the chat the various links for these for these channels, like our social media uh, accounts uh, in Twitter and LinkedIn group, the, the project website, and all the events that have been 
done in the past that are still available for you to uh, to um, to watch uh, of which this is, is this event is the, is the closing and we had of course engaged different uh, uh, part of the community through our advisory board uh, members first that I take the chance to thank directly already now and a wider group of experts that have been engaged in different topics throughout, throughout the lifetime and various contributors from the tech, tech industry to researchers in digital enhanced learning and practitioners and teachers and the school leaders in uh, in trying to combine education with, with technology. And as I said, uh, a big uh, factor was uh, during these years the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on society and uh, education particularly. So now uh, we can uh, I can move forward uh, with this uh, with this introduction it has been two intense years and this connecting the dot title that we chose is because uh, there have been various aspects that are not obviously um, uh, they are not it's not obvious to to put together and to to integrate in a coherent view for the future of digital education and uh, one keyword that i could already propose uh, and we will probably hear more about later is resilience so the importance of having resilience uh, somehow uh, as an attribute for the whole uh, education system with and without uh, technological advancement. So we will uh, we will see uh, in the next steps uh, how this can be framed uh, at the beginning, and how we, and we will discuss it with uh, with a diverse uh, panel of experts in the in the high level panel. And so I think I am now finished with the, with my introduction, and I'm ready to hand over to uh, Rehana Schwinger Ladakh for the. Um, uh, keynote address from the European Commission point of view. So I'm stopping sharing now and Rehana, if you are ready for uh, to take the stage, I thank you very much for accepting the invitation and I leave you the stage. Thank you, Giovanni. Just let me know um, if you can hear me well, uh, so that I can just move my, my microphone. Uh, it, it looks like. So um, uh, thank you, Giovanni, for the, uh, for the invitation and for the introduction. And um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A really warm welcome from sunny Luxembourg. Uh, it's, it's really nice, you know, to, to have finally a nice spring. And it is my pleasure to speak at this final conference of the Del for All uh, project. So my name is Rehana Schwilling-Galadak, and I'm the head of the unit in the Commission. Uh, which is in charge of three big um, uh, policy files. One is about interactive technology. So how can technology such as augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, how can they help uh, industrial sectors as well as societal sectors? That's one part. Another important part of my, uh, my mandate is to support the uh, digital transformation of cultural systems of cultural uh, um, uh, institutions. And the third big part is, uh, and it's, it's because of this I'm, I'm here, it's really to support the digital transformation of education systems through policy actions, funding programs, and exchange of best practices at regional, regional and national level. So the Dell for All project started uh, just a couple of months before the pandemic and, and it's ending now as we are we are moving we are into a post-pandemic world and in these 28 months of the project duration Giovanni you said it were two intense years well I would say that the world has changed huh? the challenges in a way they blew up in our faces but then the responses that we had to come up with, they were quite of unprecedented scale. And I'll, I'll speak about that in a, in a, in a few minutes. So just, just let's take a moment to look back hmm, at what happened to understand better what's, what's, what's ahead of us. So first of all, the pandemic, uh, you, you mentioned it, Giovanni. So we, we also, we witnessed, we were part of the fact that the education sector at all levels faced acute challenges in the EU, like everywhere else. Huh? Schools had to turn over in an emergency mode. And it, it brought to, surface, to the surface all the underlying weaknesses that we had been seeing, but they just became too very much acute. So in terms of digital readiness, that is in relation to connectivity, in relation to insufficient equipment and devices for students to be able to connect, in terms of 
quality, or I would say lack of quality of educational content online in terms of uh, digital competencies of educators, of parents, of students. And though we are a prosperous continent, the crisis highlighted painfully so a new digital, a new divide, which is the digital divide. And during the, the many stakeholder uh, consultations that we did, the, the, the permanent exchange of dialogue that we had during the uh, 2020 year, the key takeaway from all the responses we had, all the, 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 uh, the feedback from, from stakeholders, and it's, it won't be surprising to the audience here as you have been discussing them uh, extensively, huh? and you still continue, it still continues to feed into your reflection and, and action. So the key takeaways were, one, that COVID-19 was a turning point in the use of technologies in education. Second, uh, people at all levels, uh, educators, policymakers, parents, citizens in general, were concerned by deep, deepening socioeconomic inequalities and new divides. Third, digital competences were needed for all, for all uh, to be able to uh, continue to take part in the online world, which was an extension of, of our daily life. And also, for, especially for students in view of their future labour market. And for uh, accelerating the adoption of technologies for learning and teaching was really fundamental. So, all these takeaways were essential uh, also with our own research and analysis that we had been doing over the years to draw up one of our key immediate responses, which was the Digital Education Action Plan, which was adopted after the first uh, confinement in September 2020, as part of that long-term approach uh, of the Commission to address digital trans transformation, yep. as well as a response to the evolving COVID-19 crisis. Sorry, I, I can hear people, so if you don't mind muting, uh, Giovanni, I think that might be you. Uh, yeah, thank you. So with the Digital Education Action Plan, the overarching aim of the Commission is to bring a comprehensive vision that brings together all the enabling factors to make education fit for the digital age. So it has two strategic priorities for achieving it. One is about developing a high performing digital education ecosystem and the conversation that you are having within Dell for all about resilient ecosystem is very much part of it. It fits and it contributes to it uh, very well. And second is about how can we boost the digital skills and competences uh, for everyone to be able to uh, take part in this digital transformation process. And there are a number of actions to achieve this, uh, these two big priorities. Most of them have already started. And I will speak about one of them, which is the structured dialogue with uh, member states in a, in a couple of minutes, because it's one of our key uh, actions. So the action plan is also meant to provide guidance to member states to consider a reforms and investments in digital education by pooling different uh, actions by pulling different EU programs, as well as the new recovery and resilience facilities, which I will speak about in a moment. Let me also uh, recall very briefly, I know you've heard about it, but I think it's important also to remind the, uh, uh, the, the attendees here uh, about an important vision, uh, which will also give education systems the needed push, uh, which is the digital decade ambition of the Commission. So with the pandemic, with the global disruptions that happened everywhere, which lie bare our vulnerability in terms of supply chains, including in terms of provisions of technologies for all the sectors, huh? uh, and this included the education sector. So the objectives of the digital decade vision of the Commission is to ensure that Europe's digital transformation by 2030, because this is the uh, the, the target, the overall timeline that we have, is to make sure that we are digitally sovereign in an interconnected world. It means on the one hand, we build on our strengths, and the other, uh, on the other hand, we address strategic weaknesses and high-risk dependencies in all the sectors. So the vision comes with a compass for navigation, with four cardinal points, uh, with targets for 2030. 
uh, the, the first one is about how can we boost digital skills uh, for, for all. Secondly is how can we have, how can we ensure secure, performant and sustainable digital infrastructure. Third is about boosting the digital transformation of businesses. And fourth is about speeding up the digitalization of public services. So the combination of three elements specifically will change, will impact significantly the digital landscape uh, of the education sector. So one is clearly high speed connectivity and performance everywhere. Unfortunately, we still have a lot of places in the EU with either no connectivity or with poor connectivity. So our ambition, really our goal is that by 2030, all EU households should have gigabyte connectivity and all populated areas should be covered by 5G to make sure that we have this uh, uh, continuous uh, connectivity uh, 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 dimension. Secondly, digital skills for all. The ambition, our vision, and that's what and one we are, we are working on very, very uh, how to say, intensely, is that by 2030, at least 80% of all adults in the EU should have basic digital skills to be able to take part in democratic life, to be able to uh, take part in, in their uh, in, in, and grow in their jobs. And uh, we should have 20 million ICT specialists in the EU because we need those 20 million ICT specialists to be able to develop our own EU-made solutions. And third, it's better tools and capacity to handle the data and develop these uh, Made in Europe solutions. So by 2030, we want that three out of four companies that they should use the facilities that we are developing in terms of cloud, in terms of big data access and sharing, and in terms of AI uh, facilities. So this is really in, in a nutshell, uh, what are the, the two big policy visions, the digital education plan and the digital, de the digital decay. And in parallel to these policy responses, the commission has been working hand in hand with member states to finalize the recovery and resilience uh, facility plans. You've been hearing them a lot uh, for the past 15 months. So these funds, the recovery funds, they present really unprecedented investments in education, which were long overdue, we agree. Digital education is a strategic priority in many uh, national plans. Almost all member states plan to use funds for uh, uh, in digital education. In some countries, uh, like, like for, for instance in Germany, uh, the digitalization of the education system is a key objective of the education component of the national plan. In terms of component, what we have seen is that the investments will go from less than 1% to about 10% uh, in, in countries like Belgium. And funds will either support the digital transition of education and training systems and or developing digital skills as well as modernizing actually the buildings, because that's also something which is very much needed to also support the uh, twin transition, uh, uh, the, the, the climate transition. So the top uh, five investment areas that we have been seeing uh, in the national plans are digital infrastructure, digital skills uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, adult population, teacher training on digital uh, education, and the platforms, uh, because also member states, um, they uh, also approach uh, digital education in a holistic manner. So they do see that we need to bring all these enabling factors, the infrastructure, the connectivity, the platforms, the content, uh, so that we can push uh, forward the modernization of, of education systems. And we had many exchanges with member states in the process of growing up these plans. We had a lot of back and forth, and this holistic, comprehensive approach towards education was always our guiding principles. Don't only invest in one part, really look at all the different enabling factors. And now, to make sure that these investments will bear fruit, member states will also benefit from a dedicated support and guidance by the European Commission in order to continue investing smartly uh, and also uh, undertake the necessary policy reforms uh, that will allow uh, an effective and inclusive digital education. So 
This is why uh, the Commission has launched a strategic dialogue with member states and relevant stakeholders like the edtech sector and academia. It is also one of our key actions of the Digital Education Plan, and it is one where we have a lot of intense work uh, going up, uh, right, going on right now. Uh, this strategic or structured dialogue uh, is it is a high level reflection and discussion forum uh, about all the enabling factors for a successful digital education process so it is about how can we tackle connectivity gaps by using eu funds as well as member states and private funding it's about tackling uh, equipment gaps uh, using also all the different funding and, and setting up schemes uh, where we can reuse um, uh, you know, uh, existing, ex existing schemes that are there, how can we um, merge uh, 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 existing schemes, what, are, what is needed, so connectivity gaps, uh, equipment gaps. It's also about a gaps in capacity, capacity building, by supporting education and training institution with know-how on how to adapt and digitize in an inclusive manner, you know, using all the different uh, uh, tools, existing tools that are out there, there are a number of them. It's also about addressing accessibility uh, and availability of assistive technologies. We have a lot of students who have some form of disability, so how can we make sure that this process remains an inclusive uh, process so no student left behind and it's it's also about encouraging uh, member states to foster a close dialogue uh, on digital education within the remit between the different stakeholders uh, in, in their country and it's also about uh, encouraging member states to develop uh, their own guidelines uh, on, on pedagogy for, uh, uh, it's about drawing up from best practice and experience within countries, but also uh, from one country to, to, to the other, uh, and upskilling their teacher. So the, the structured dialogue has started. It will go on uh, this whole year. We will, we will have one-to-one uh, -one dialogues with member states. And at the beginning of next year, uh, the Commission will present uh, two important uh, policy documents, which will be recommendation on, on how we can further boost digital skills and what are the enabling factors uh, for, for digital education. So there will be uh, further consultations uh, uh, with stakeholders during this, uh, this, this year. So I really encourage you uh, to, be, to be part of those, those consultations because your input is very valuable to, for us uh, to draw up our own, uh, our own recommendation. Now, a lot of policy makers, academia, educators, uh, the edtech uh, industry has also an important role in this dialogue, given its key role in the digital transformation of educational systems. Even though there is an upward trend, Europe is comparatively a late adopter of digital education technologies, um, and we rely uh, until quite we rely a lot on, on technologies and, and, and content and services uh, from, from outside the EU. So if we look at the numbers um, in worldwide, you know, the, the investment uh, between 20, 2020 and 21 has traveled, uh, whereas in Europe, the investments between 2019 and 21, they only increased by 10%. So this means that we can do more, much more to support the edtech industries. The, the European edtech are growing uh, and, and for really for solutions and services really that use data, uh, data technology, extended reality technology, AI enabled learning environments, we can really we can we can tap into that market to be to, to really support uh, the development of made in EU, uh, made in EU uh, solutions for, for the education sector. So for us, it is important that we nurture a European ed tech that will build, that will develop this uh, Europe solu European solutions that respect our core values and important principles such as privacy, data protection and, and safety, just to name a few. And to this effect, we have right now a 
call, which is open under the Digital Europe program, which is one of the new programs uh, of, of, of this uh, generation, which is really uh, dedicated to the deployment of technologies. Uh, Horizon is about, the, the, about R&D. The Digital Europe program is about deployment. So the call, uh, which, is, which is open, um, the, the aim of the call is one, to support a closer collaboration between the edtech uh, sector and all other relevant stakeholders across Europe. Secondly, it's about fostering the exchange of good practices at European level. It's about uh, uh, supporting increased capacities uh, through the edtech sector of national education systems. It's about supporting the edtech companies uh, through mentoring and training services. And we also want, um, the, uh, through this call, to develop, to have a roadmap uh, towards a European edtech ecosystem uh, that will promote uh, uh, innovation and education. Uh, so we are very much, uh, the, the call will close in about a month. I will circulate uh, through, through Martel the link, but I think if you Google it, you, you'll find it. Um, so uh, uh, so this, 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 this will be an important step uh, in really uh, bringing together, in um, um, consolidating the European EdTech uh, sector. I'll, I'll also now uh, quickly mention uh, what we are doing in terms of data. Uh, because we know that data is also key uh, when it comes to the modernization of education systems in developing solutions that will be adapted to, to, to our uh, environments. Um, the, uh, a few words, uh, first of all, about the European data strategy and how it will serve the, the digital education. So the overall aim of the uh, data strategy is to make the EU a leader in a data-driven society. It's about creating a single market for data to, for, to flow freely within the EU and across sectors for the benefit of all, for researchers, for public administrations, uh, for businesses, um, for um, areas of public interest like education, like health, uh, like, like uh, cities, smart cities. And we again we saw uh, with with the with COVID nineteen uh, the the critical role of data uh, uh, of digital technologies and of digital infrastructures in our lives, and how we can all benefit uh, for, uh, from better, uh, uh, more high quality data for uh, and, and for more for more data. So the development of common European data spaces in strategic sectors will be a key element of our data strategy. Uh, the, our ambition is to have data spaces in a number of key uh, sectors, like, for instance, uh, 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 smart cities, in culture, in media, in tourism, in financial services. So we have a number of them uh, that have been launched. We'll have a uh, more to come. So the data spaces are federated ecosystems that allow to share and access data. Uh, so how can you make data available uh, for, between data owners, data providers, and uh, data users for a variety of purposes? And um, the, the idea is how do we put in place these sectoral data spaces in these key uh, domains, and how do we link them to foster uh, exchange between the different sectors? So the, my unit is in charge of four data spaces in cultural heritage, in media, in tourism, and in digital skills. So we are right now preparing the deployment of a European data space for skills which will be a secure and trusted data space for sharing and accessing data in relation to digital skills. Uh, it can be the data in relation to job offers, it can be the list of academic curricula and certifications, it can be a list of inventory of topics studied at all levels. It's really in relation to skills, digital skills, uh, for, uh, for education and training in the wide sense. And uh, we, 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 our, our aim is that the data uh, which will be available can then be reused for a variety of purpose, from analytic and statistical purpose to policy development and reuse in innovative applications. So I think that's going to be also important for the community uh, there 
to know that they can have access to this data. So the uh, the, the project will start and, and um, it will develop a roadmap for building such a data space. And we hope to be able to see the first tangible elements in 18 months time uh, from, from now on. So these are uh, some of the uh, actions that are ongoing that will support uh, the digital transformation, the modernization of, of, of the education system. And uh, I, I, I will conclude my, 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 uh, my speech, which has already been quite long, and I'm, I'm, I apologize for, for, for really taking too much of your time. As I said in the, in the opening, uh, in these past two years, indeed, the world has changed. Not only have we learned a lot about our gaps and our strengths, thanks to the work of our project, such as Dell for All, we also have a deep understanding of what technologies can do for teachers and students, for educators, for parents. We know what it can do yet and where we need to invest in the short term and in the medium term. We have a vision for modernizing education systems and make them fit for the digital age. We have a political will uh, at all level, at European level, at national level, to push things forward, to accelerate the modernization of the education systems in a holistic and comprehensive manner. And this is something really is done, which is really how do we bring together all the different uh, components. And uh, I have to say, we have also the means uh, of the ambitions through the different funding programs that we can combine uh, through the Recovering Resilience Fund, which are a fantastic opportunity for the sector, through the Horizon Euro programs, to Erasmus+, Plus, through the Digital Euro program. And these will allow us really to uh, bring in these different uh, funding streams and, and, and to really uh, to shift the lines. So uh, on this optimistic note, uh, because we have to be hopeful for the future more than ever, I will leave you and, and thank you so much for listening to me. And I wish you really a very nice, productive and successful conference. Thank you. Back to you, Giovanni. Thank you very much, Rihanna. This was a great uh, introduction, I think, for everyone. Uh, and I hope that the public uh, has seen how wide is really the landscape where Dell for All and the whole digital education initiative and the next steps that, that will be will be taken are, are set on. But this is not really for me to, 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 to discuss this too much because I have the pleasure of uh, <coughs> handing over to a host, uh, uh, to a group of, uh, of experts and uh, the, my colleague uh, Alex, uh, if you are ready for the, the high level panel, I can just hand over to you without further ado. Thank you very much, Alex. The floor is yours. Um, thanks, Giovanni. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. I, I don't know about you, but I, I found that very insightful, um, what, what Rihanna had to, had to say. And I think, um, I'd also like to use that in a way as a bit of a, a background for for what this panel is is going to be about. Um, I think we'll this will run for about an hour or just over an hour. I think um, my my first suggestion is that assuming that everybody's on stage, so if you can put um, your cameras on, I guess that would also be be helpful um, for my colleagues. Um, and what I'd really like to do is is first do like a bit of a roundtable as to as to who these people are, um, and I'll, 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 let, let, let me start with, with myself, I guess. I'm, I'm anchoring this. My name's Alex Gregg. I run the uh, the 3CL Foundation, which is a foundation based, uh, an edtech foundation based in Malta. And uh, our primary focus is on um, the strategic use of emerging technologies in education. Um, so we're interested in anything from, you know, I guess the blockchain and the metaverse to um, understanding how the whole education world went into panic mode when COVID happened and realized that people didn't know how to use Zoom, for instance. Um, we're very much interested in, in digital literacies, um, and that's one of our strong points. We're interested in misinformation. We're interested in digital citizenship more than anything else. Um, I also teach at the, at the University of Malta, so I'm, I guess I have two hats here. I'm also you know, I have to face people who in, in, in lecture halls or classrooms, and those people pivoted the way 
for a while and now they're kind of back in the halls but they're still wearing masks we're still in this kind of strange strange face um so that's that's who i am so i'm very pleased to have uh, my colleagues with me over here so if i can ask all of you i mean as i'm going to go through it systematically i'm um, not to spend more than a minute but what i'd like to hear from people really is not just who they are and and what organization they work for but also um what what are you working on right now so if i if i can start let me start with alessia first alessia you're my guinea pig off you go thank you thank you alex for for giving me the floor and uh, good morning everyone and thank you for inviting me to this uh, to this panel this morning so my name is Alessia Messuti and uh, I work for the International Training Center of the International Labor Organization. So it's a UN agency and the training center is based uh, in Italy. In particular, I am uh, working in a program that is called Learning Innovation. So within the training center of the ILO, we are tasked with uh, uh, promoting learning innovation uh, 360 degrees, uh, supporting our training uh, department in uh, uh, scanning latest methodologies and technologies in order to support the rollout of capacity building programs for our constituents, which are trade unionist uh, um, em employers, organizations and ministries of, of labors and uh, governments. And uh, in particular, what we are up uh, now, just to keep it uh, short, I am in charge of uh, making sure that uh, uh, we have a reliable uh, learning infrastructure, a digital ecosystem that uh, our constituents can benefit uh, from, making sure that we can uh, uh, mainstream at the institutional level throughout the rollout of our programs, uh, not only in Europe, but also in developing countries, programs that are uh, aligned with quality assurance guidelines that we keep up to date as uh, we move on from pandemic to post-pandemic worlds. And what I'm working on uh, basically uh, the, the rollout of new products that uh, revolve around uh, new skills that are in uh, need among our constituents in particular what does it mean to be a virtual facilitator right now uh, in a new uh, ecosystem and uh, in uh, when uh, new modalities also are demanded and also uh, digital inclusion is also one of our main focus uh, at the moment what does it mean and how can we achieve it over to you alex Thanks, Alessia. Um, Perrin, you're my next victim. Off you go. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be your guinea pig <laughs> again. Um, and uh, yes, thank you uh, to give me this opportunity to represent what we are doing within my University of Lille, but also as France and within the European Blockchain Partnership where I work together with Luis, uh, for example. Um, so I work, I am part of the, the Directorate for Pedagogical Innovation of my university on two main subjects, which are blockchain and open education. And with blockchain, we, we finalized now <laughs> the reinvention of the object diploma. And uh, this, I will, uh, I will speak about it later. And, uh, and this not only within our university, which uh, amounts to uh, 80,000 students, but also at European level uh, within this uh, fantastic uh, partnership uh, that uh, where, where a lot of people from higher education came in 2018 and said there is something to do on credentials and diplomas. And, and secondly, I, I love the thematic of open educational resources, and I think that really it's a moment uh, in, in their history, in their 20 years old is history, uh, now that the pandemic, pandemic has happened, to give access, um, uh, access with uh, intellectual property right, and thanks to informatics and uh, copy-paste <laughs> possibilities, um, to, to give a better access to quality educational contents. I am a member of the board, an elected member of the board of the Open Education Global Association. Uh, so both thematics are really important to me and also that we all speak different language today in English, but it, this is also accessible in, in many languages. Thank you. Thanks, Varine. 
Claudia, why don't you go next? Thank you, Alex. Yes, happy to. So um, also let me start with saying thank you for having me on this panel. Um, I am Claudia Harmschmidt, uh, based uh, in Germany and uh, part of a startup that uh, that is called University for Industry. It's not a real university, but it is actually, um, we're a small team of people who have, um, who have as our mission to become the- Sorry, uh, Alex, do you provider. hear Claudia? Because she seems to have difficulties to- Can you hear me? To come and, yes, you do? Okay, I don't, I don't hear her. Oh. Shall I come closer? <laughs> Sorry. No, you're fine, Claudia. You continue. Okay, so so um, uh, what we do in University for Industry, and we've been um, associated with the Dell for All project from the start, is um, we take everything that's um, that has something to do with digital transformations, digitalization blockchain, machine learning, and bring it into uh, industry. So, so um, our, um, our uh, learning groups are actually grown-ups. So it's all about adult learning, lifelong learning, and, um, and making sure, coming back to what Rihanna just said, making sure that that uh, everyone has the necessary or can get the necessary skills to be up to date on what is happening because so much is happening. So, um, so this is where, where I come from and I'm looking forward to discuss everything that we're going to look at now in this panel from the upskilling and reskilling and adult learner perspective. Thanks, Claudia. Um, Luis, why don't you go? Tell us what you're doing. Can't hear you, Luis. You're muted. <laughs> you have to go down to the bottom of the screen and, uh, and you'll find that. Uh... Okay, what's, what's Luis is trying to set up? Let's, let's, let's go with Klaus in the meantime, then we'll come back to Luis. Klaus, why don't you go? Thank you, Alex. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Klaus. I'm a founder of an ad tech company here in Malta. And um, my work primarily right now is working with school leadership teams whose message whenever they reach out is basically the same. How can we prevent things going back to the way they were? Because even though we've done, I think, tremendous advances over the past two years when it comes to digital skills, uh, what we're seeing now that COVID is receding a little bit is that we are falling back into old habits. And um, this is not happening only locally. Um, we're seeing this basically uh, across many European countries across the world even. And uh, it means that even though we now have the skills, uh, or, or at least we have some skills that came out of this emergency teaching scenario that we had with COVID, it did not necessarily translate into an acceptance of those skills or rather an acceptance of the need for those things to become the new normal. And uh, that is the area that I'm primarily focused on right now. Thanks, Klaus. Um, Luis, have you managed to fix it? If you move your mouse to the end of the screen, to the bottom of the screen, just by moving the mouse, you will, you should, it should be opening up. If not, probably the best thing to do is leave it and join and join the call again. I think that might work. So in the meantime, Martin, can you, okay? Yeah, good morning. And uh, also my thanks uh, for uh, inviting me to this panel. Um, I am afraid that I have to admit that I'm uh, slightly an outsider to this uh, panel in that I'm the director of education for EIT Food. So we are the largest uh, innovation ecosystem in Europe um, on uh, sort of transforming the food system into something that is more sustainable and healthy. And so uh, my most of my job is actually 
concerned with um, sort of uh, the competencies uh, to create innovators and entrepreneurs that can actually drive that uh, food system transformation. And for me, uh, digital skills are actually a, a way of uh, achieving that uh, rather than I'm uh, me being an expert on, on digital skills per se. But I think um, I'm sort of what I'm working on at the moment, and I, I think it connects a lot with what uh, Klaus and what Alessio were saying in that um, quality assurance is uh, very important on kind of how do we retain uh, the focus on uh, digital skills uh, post uh, COVID, but also how do we do that in a quality assured way that actually we've got the evidence of impact that we can uh, sort of uh, work on and uh, that, that we can demonstrate towards employers uh, that people are coming in with, uh, with the right skills. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Martin. Um, Luis, one final attempt before you we, we move on, the, if you manage to move the your mouse down. Okay, and by the way, this is this is symptomatic of what we've all been through, you no, know, for the last two and a half years. I mean, with you know, as I said, I'm I'm keeping an eye to the left of my screen because my cat is here. So this is you know the whole world that we're into of technology functions, malfunctions, and and the rest of it. Okay. Um, Okay, if Luis, Luis, if you still got problems, can you get out of the system and, and come back again? And I think that's the best way of, of doing this. Um, in a way, um, I want to pick up from what Martin said, which was, um, you know, not quite fitting in here. And yet, I think what's unusual about... Hi, Alex. You are here now, Luis. Oh, so, sorry, you I, I don't and know I, what happened. It. So it, worked, yeah, it worked this morning, so... There you go. <laughs> but, so, but okay, Louis, yeah. tell people oh, where you oh. are. Seeing, the, seeing you're a CIO, it's even more interesting. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. As, as I said by Alex, uh, my name is Luis Arino, and I am the CIO of, uh, of uh, Robido, at Robido Vigili University. That's a public university in, in south of Catalonia, in Spain. Uh, but I am also linked uh, to the National Association of Spanish University Rectors. Uh, developing several international uh, activities in the context of the ICT sectorial uh, committee. Mm -hmm. uh, let me highlight maybe three uh, key initiatives that I am working on uh, more linked to with, with today's session. The first uh, is the enabling uh, of a new paradigm uh, introduced by, by Perrin uh, for the flexibility of education, uh, thanks to the combination of a set of emerging technologies such as uh, decentralization, uh, sovereignty, uh, and blockchain uh, in the so-called uh, European blockchain service infrastructure uh, uh, with the diplomas use case. The second one uh, should be the definition of a common data model for the higher education sector in Spain and contributing to the definition of the Spanish skills data space, as well as the alignment uh, of, of that data space respect to those that are being defined in the GAIA-X uh, initiative. Uh, and that also Perrin was <laughs> well. Uh, and finally, together with uh, 13 other, 30 other universities in Spain, we are working on how to introduce the uh, micro-credentials, competency and skills framework, uh, and its accreditation and recognition into the more uh, traditional uh, training of her. That's all. Thanks, Luis. Um... I was talking about this as being a slightly unusual panel, and I'll, I'll explain why. Normally, when you get these panels, they, they, they tend to be people from higher education and stuff like that. And what I noticed is, is that we've got, I guess, Perrin is vaguely higher education, I guess, University of Lille. I'm kind of halfway house. Luis is. But then we've got people from industry, people consulting to industry, people working for training organizations. So this, this kind of panel has a kind of... Let me let me put, put it bluntly up more pragmatic maybe more more hands-on view of the world and i think it's something which i want to pick on here um i was making some notes um when rihanna was was speaking and at one stage she said you, you know europe needs to focus on infrastructure digital skills teacher training and platforms or learning platforms as such and i think that's something which we should all keep at the back of our mind. I'll also try and triangulate that with what the research agenda of Delft for All um, came up with. And this is where we started asking various experts and communities of practice scattered all over Europe, what, you know, what do you think is going on and what should we focus on? And besides the usual thing about uncertainties, about the affordances of, you know, emerging tech in such strange times, 
there was still this feeling that we're moving to a truly, truly digital society. But, you know, was COVID a game changer or not? Are things going to go back to the way they used to be? And there was a, quite a lot of time when we're talking about new normals or normals, we're going to go back. And now it seems like we're kind of in this strange, strange space of where we're going. But the, the expert community said that there were three key areas which needed to be prioritized for future research activities. Remember that but what Del for All is, is, is doing is, is providing, you know, research, active research, I guess, to, to, to policymakers and the EU as to what should they fund, what should they do in the future. These three key priorities were one, digital pedagogy, whatever that means. The second one was back to lifelong learning, which maybe wasn't so sexy and is now has now come back. What do we mean by that, I think? And the third thing is we really need to ha have a concentrated effort at some sort of equity to address this digital divide. So and I'm going to turn around now to all the panels and I think I'd like, I'd like a 60 second no more in a way view from everybody. You know, so should policy makers be focusing on these, what are these four areas that Rihanna was talking about, infrastructure, digital skills, teacher training or platforms? these other things, digital pedagogy, which I guess fit, fit in somewhere over there, lifelong learning at the back of our mind, and this whole idea about equity. Is that where we should be going when this project initially set up to be looking at the impact of emerging technologies on the state of education? So I don't know if somebody wants to volunteer or go first, or whether I will start volunteering people. Anybody wants to come on with a 60 second thing? I know, if, you know, there's many poster stickers on the wall. Which one would you like to go for? So, and if I have, go, someone. Okay, so, so I will, I will uh, volunteer to go first here. I think the, um, um, it aligns very nicely the three uh, the three key priorities you have with um, what we heard from Rihanna and what what is actually now what are the so, questions we are facing and I think um, is Claudia speaking <laughs> yes <laughs> that's very strange that uh, that one of you cannot hear me. Okay, we can hear you, Claudia. So continue. So, um, so uh, I I wanted to say that that I think it, it aligns very nicely, and this the whole uh, question of of um, emerging technologies and and um, like which technologies are the right ones for learning now, irrespective of whether it's um, which stage in life you are in. Um, I would say. Uh, the whole pandemic has actually just made things faster and may and and focused us on what works what doesn't work we could do trial and error in a very quick cycle so i think um my 60 seconds are are over but but i would say this um it's a bit similar to what we had to do in the in the past two years really go full force in in trying out finding out what works so things got accelerated, right? That's what you yes. mean. Speed. Everything got speeded up. So it's almost like, and that's why when I think of Dell for All in our first meeting, we were in Luxembourg initially. And you know, we're talking about blockchain and AI, a bit of AI at the time, and suddenly this thing called COVID happened, and suddenly we're like on a on a different train. And now I I I feel at the end of this two years plus, which we're, we're trying to figure out what the rail track is is going to be. Um right. Yeah. If, if I am allowed, Alex. Yes. Uh, I agree that uh, maybe the COVID uh, has accelerated the. I, I don't know. I'm not sure if say the adoption of technologies, or say that the, the opportunity or the availability of technology to be there. But for me, the, the main challenge uh, remains on, on real adoption, uh, as you said. Was it just, uh, OK, so from a technical perspective, there was a, a clear reaction tools were in place uh, so after some delay in some in some organizations uh, the more or less normal activity <laughs> came thanks to new technologies but as you say uh, once things 
come back to the normal or new normal, I don't know how to say it, uh, some of the more legacy culture also came back. That, that's that's the problem. So it is a mean or, or, or it's an opportunity to do things in a different way. That, that's, that's the key point. Right? And for me, the investment should be on the culture, uh, on, on enabling really uh, the, the, the skills and on also uh, the, 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 the tools and technology, but the skills from all teachers, uh, students, but they are, I think, one, one, one step ahead of us, uh, and the, uh, the staff from, from, from educational institutions uh, to really to live in, the, in it, to look for opportunities, to uh, identify what's the value for uh, the that we can give that for me is the learning experience on premise on site and what is the value that can be uh, an other value that can, technologies can add to the learning path that, yeah, that's my, I, I, had, my I had the word adoption somewhere so in a way i'm trying to fix one word for what you guys are saying to throw this in the mix right so we've got speed adoption adjustment who else would like to go in Varin, do you want to come in as you're driving in or you're still you're still trying to can you hear us because again this is this is a uh, typical yeah uh, i missed some of the conversation due to all right so we can hear you Perin. okay yeah. so what all right is, uh, does anybody want to dive in first because i will i will pick on you Alessia, why don't you go? You say Alessia, no? Yes, I did. Well, I think that's <laughs> no. good, isn't it? That's really... <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no, it's interesting. And uh, yeah, I wanted to pick up also one word that was said by, um, by Luis that was about culture, no? Culture and experiences, uh, which I think are also very important. And also to connect with uh, one of the, you know, key areas of the research agenda that you mentioned at the beginning, you no? Know, one of the priority areas is lifelong learning, which is not a new concept, but uh, is, uh, you know, back uh, <laughs> in the agenda right now. And uh, actually, like from my perspective, you know, training, I'm working in a training center and we need to support actually uh, our constituents in uh, ongoing learning and lifelong learning is one of our core areas. Therefore, yes, I think lifelong learning should be there, but should be reconceived, you no? Know, because uh, you know, definitely, uh, adoption of technology is uh, accelerating uh, not only the how learning is happening, but also how um, things can be completely go in the wrong way, and. Um, the world of work is also changing at the same time, no? And uh, there are reshaped workplaces, uh, there are new workers that are coming up with new needs. So probably the question from our side or the, the question that was, uh, you know, on our agenda as well from the last two years was how can we create a culture of curiosity and personal growth that support lifelong learning, productivity at work, while, you know, uh, building up, leveraging on technology. And one of the experiments we have been trying with, uh, you know, communities uh, of constituents we are supporting is how, how can we transform the, uh, you know, the, 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 the model, the 70, 20, 10 model in, uh, in a way that is more adapted to, to, to this new digital ecosystem. So we, 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 we know that learning mostly happens outside the classroom, but still we are spending most of our time in Zoom rooms, so um, uh, for so how can we can we adapt this model? How can we leverage on technology in a way that sixty percent of our learning is experiential, twenty percent of our learning is social, ten percent is a self-paced, is traditional, is more structured, and then ten percent is reflective. So we are looking at how can we remix and recombine these percentages in a way that uh, we boost learning, we adapt to learning, but we use technology in uh, in uh, in these uh, different uh, phases, in these different moments. So that's our challenge, of course, and, uh, and as Claudia was saying, trial and error process as well. Okay, so now we've got, be aware of different cultures. It's like lifelong learning 3.0, right? We're getting, we're getting into everything speeded up. This idea of experiential learning and learning happening outside the classroom, I think. I think one of the things that COVID did is make a lot of people in the ivory towers of education realize that there's a lot of learning happening outside people trying to regurgitate, you know, lecturers' notes. Okay. 
Um, right. Who else would like to go first? I've still got to hear from Perrin. I've got to hear from Luis. Yeah. Not from Luis. I've got to hear from Klaus. And I've got to hear from Martin. So off you go. Perrin. Yeah. All right, so about culture, I have been surprised to hear several teachers telling me that the level had uh, decreased in the last two years, in the past two years, because many, many young students uh, did not learn how to learn. <laughs> and practically, it was difficult for them to be only on Zoom, and now they're eating in the classroom. And it's uh, really difficult for the teachers to be there because they're, they're, it's it's all a new style plus decrease of the level of the students. So this is something to tackle, I guess, in the next year to, to, to find ways to re, reconnect them with, <laughs> with a, a bit more traditional learning, but also to, of course, they like to be on Zoom uh, partly and, uh, and teachers too. So there is something definitely that has changed. And that is um, that is positive. And on the other hand, um, it, it, we we don't know how much it, it is good. <laughs> From what I hear, and the last time I spoke with an informatics teacher, he said it will come at some point. They will, uh, you know, make the effort of uh, learning again. So this is just for culture, or you know, the way also teacher take care, take more care, or understand better if the students are not well, and and they ask, um, and they respect also that people just don't feel like coming, or, or and this is something new to 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 have this culture of care now. Uh, and not only for students, but also for teachers and em employees within the public service. Perrin, I think I think what you mentioned is really important, actually, because this this idea of are we having a, a poorer learning experience? And I'm thinking of the various stakeholders, right? Because normally, you know, within the EU framework, sometimes we we you know I, I know we we're, we're here to help policymakers, but when you look at the stakeholders, the parents. The kids, the learners, and the learners, we're talking about lifelong learning. You know, the student might well be aged 92, like my father in law, and he's still doing some learning of his own. Okay. As he sits on his new sit on device with Bluetooth speakers. Okay. He's a learner too. Okay. So I think, I think that's something. So, Klaus, I think this is, it comes very much into your theory. Okay. You're always telling me about, you know, institutions. Compulsory education, should you go and do it somewhere else? So over to you, what do you think about all of this? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, coming back to your initial question, which is, are those the right focus areas uh, that Rihanna mentioned? I think absolutely yes. I think what is very interesting to consider is that I don't think those focus areas have actually been different for the past 20, 25 years. We've always talked about teacher training, devices, technology, platforms, infrastructure. I think what is kind of important to consider is then why did COVID create such a problem? Uh, because literally, I think in, in a month, everybody realized that, oh, crap, you know, nothing that we've actually been saying we've been doing seems to have stuck. And uh, coming back to your question, is this the right area? Yes. Is the approach the correct approach? That I think is a little bit more open to discussion, because if we simply do again what we've been doing, which is encourage big centralized programs, buying a lot of stuff, rolling out a lot of technology, and then turning around and saying, wow, you know, Europe is digitally evolved and technically uh, advanced because all the schools now have X amount of stuff and all our universities are interconnected and have, you know, gigabit connections or, or terabit connections or whatever else you want to put in there and everything is AI powered and everything is, uh, you know, we have VR and XR and AR and all of these technologies coming out of our ears. I don't think that it will actually have a transformative impact. It's going to be yet another laundry list of things that we cross off. But if there's yet another pandemic that we cannot forecast or, pre or, or prepare for specifically, we might end up being in exactly the same situation we were in with COVID, but in a couple of years time. And I think it goes directly to what Luis and others have said here that 
we need to find a better way to measure impact, to measure transformation, to measure uh, that. I mean, I'm going to use a phrase from business here, which is something that maybe a lot of academics don't like to do. But uh, I think it's time we start t talking seriously about return on investment in education in the same way that we measure it or in a similar way, not the same way, but in a, in a, 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 a analogous way to how we measure return on investment in business. Uh, I, I was talking recently at the Chamber of Commerce event and the president of the chamber leant over, uh, over at one point and told me, you know, education is probably the only thing in the world where we pour money into it and we are happy to get no results or no improvement, not no results. And I think it's time to really ask the question, why? Why is that acceptable? And what needs to change for that to happen? And while business is, is not the only, of course, guiding principle here, uh, there are fundamental differences between business and education. I think the fundamental principle that simply spending money and using that as a justification or as a, as a, as a measure of success cannot be acceptable. All right, I'm gonna. Okay, so what I'm getting from you is like, yeah, we great. We know what the problem is. How do we fix it? And your fear is that we're gonna try and fix it the way that we, we always do by yeah. more reports and more research and more. And I think your point about um, why now, I think is important, you know, because so many of us have known, I mean, many of us who have been in the open education movement, you know, for many years, those were people were pretty much marginalized until people realized that the kids were back home. And so they were, you know, it's not just the screen they were being told by educators, go listen to this thing on YouTube or something like watch this thing on YouTube or listen to a podcast. Um, so I think your ROI um, point is well made. And I think there's need for a, a bit of more of a grassroots. I mean, look at us, where are the learners here? And do we ever listen to them? I think that's also an important point. Martin, you, you're the last one left, and I'm, int I'm intrigued in your, you know, what you do, seeing it's very practical, and, and what you've heard right now. Yeah, so um, I think, so the, there's the, the reskilling and upskilling agenda that I think has been tremendously helpful, um, at least within the European Union, to actually refocus and to be able to have a conversation with um, uh, industry partners about um, uh, and employers about uh, kind of the skills that are uh, required because we see that uh, transition towards uh, different skill sets now of course the food system is um, still something where it's still very very tangible um, uh, kind of uh, we can't do the food system in in the digital world there, there still is uh, physical stuff that needs to be produced and that needs to be shifted and so uh, for us, that has been a really interesting uh, dynamic uh, there where uh, we've been looking at particularly uh, how do we do capacity building uh, in COVID, but also post uh, COVID. Um, and um, so we came to the conclusion that there are certain things that uh, in the digital world, you're going to need to rethink your entire uh, education approach as a whole to actually understand how do digital technologies come into this, uh, but also where do you where do you gain something, but also where do you lose out uh, something in that transition? And um, so we've uh, kind of uh, come really down on the point of um, what is absolute key is uh, to focus, to, to shift from pedagogy into andragogy. Um, we need to have self-directed uh, and self-propelled uh, learning because if we're uh, continuing uh, with uh, pedagogical approaches, um, it is going to be, still be the, the model of uh, trying to stuff uh, knowledge and skills into uh, people. But if, the, if they are missing that uh, pool of uh, why they would want to do this, I think that's, uh, yeah, that we, we need to get the right. And I think this is where I would um, indeed agree with, with Klaus. We need to have a metric. Now, uh, for us, whether or not uh, ROI is, is the right one or whether actually there is a broader uh, sort of conversation to be had about the impact that we want to have our learners to have in uh, food system transformation. I mean, that's for us, our application, of course, but uh, the broader impact in society and that that is a, a move towards a more sustainable society, that for us is uh, if we can evidence that then I think we've got an argument towards the, the, the taxpayer that yes, the money was well spent because it's, it creates a, 
a better society. But this is one where we need to be, of course, very mindful of the fact that if we push this too far, it becomes too utilitarian and we would do away with all the humanities uh, because they don't put... Um, so I would not argue to go that way, but it is more about actually what uh, kind of society do we, do we want to see? What are the big challenges uh, that uh, we're faced at the moment and how do the new skill sets actually respond uh, to that and, and create uh, some kind of uh, a, a way forward there um, that uh, we we can see, yeah, kind of towards a more sustainable society. I would say. Thanks, Martin. I, I think we're all agreeing we're in a moment, right? It's an interesting moment. Um, I think about a week after COVID really hit, hit us. I remember having a conversation with John DeBank, who's also from Open University, who's also part of this. And John and I were kind of nodding to each other and say, oh boy, guess what's gonna happen when the old pedagogical world shifts online and people realize they don't even, they haven't used the keyboard for a while. There was all of resistance, human resistance. And yet somehow all of that stuff has been kind of sorted out somehow now. Okay, so a lot of people who resisted it now and grudgingly had to get to the screen. Um, I like that Martin was talking there about how far does the pendulum go? Okay, because he said we need to go from pedagogy to andragogy, uh, andragogy, right? So, and he said, but the trouble is, is this, are we talking about a more utilitarian model of education? Because the way things are going, and I'm, I work in social sciences essentially, right? Even though I used to be in business once in my life. So I do understand that bit of, world, of the world too. Um, we're in this moment. Um, I, want to, I want to try and focus now on some of these things that we keep on hearing, these buzzwords. Okay? One of them is ecosystem, for instance. No, we need to have a new education ecosystem. And whenever I, I kind of start to challenge people and say, tell me what you mean by an ecosystem, you kind of start, people get very nervous. All of us use these words to try and kind of get across as to what we mean. One of the things I keep on hearing about is this word called, you know, we talk about the dynamics of learning in the digital age. We're learning differently in the digital age. And I want to try and focus a bit of, on this one. And, and, my, and I was going to start with thinking to Claudia about this one, because I know you mentioned this. So what do you mean? What do we mean by this thing called the dynamics of learning in the digital age? Yes. Um, uh, I'm glad you asked, because this is a question. <laughs> we are like, our team is um, grappling with every day, actually. So. Um, the dynamics of learning, it, it can go all the way from saying um, uh, like digital transformation, what does it mean? What, what does uh, someone working in an automotive company on the shop floor need to know? And what does someone need to know who may uh, lead his or her own small or medium sized business? Like, do they need to like, We've just had a program for small and medium sized enterprises in Germany where we where we said um, the challenge is to be part of to to exist in five years, to be part of this whole um, uh, digital age. And um, you need to you need some basic knowledge. You need some basic literacy like um, this is now for for small and medium enterprises who may not have you know may not need a, a platform or a, a big data approach or may not even need machine learning but they need to know what it is and when it can come in for example when they when they uh for their own employees to empower them for their for their customers for their products for their processes for all of these to think about what does it mean, a digital transformation, what do we need to do? And then there's, uh, it goes all the way, challenges of um, that we have, that we say like um, 2000 people in on the shop floor need to know about like the, the what that what it means for them that they, uh, that industrial security, OT security operation, is an important topic and you need to teach like 2000 people at once for example and how do you do that without um without making it like i don't know 
mandatory and people dropping off and not, not motivated to go through, I don't know, two hours of content, online video content, but actually have group discussions, have digital labs where hands-on you can do something, try out things like, like uh, you said before, the resistance is, of course, it's, it's the resistance to, to just consuming content uh, online is, uh, is, is there and it's growing also. So you have to be much more, um, you have to be much more, you have to be careful and much more um, uh, taking into account that people, that the target groups, uh, they, they, you need to understand them very well before you give them a learning program and then um, so I would say that's one of the challenges this this tailoring the learning to the learners and and we're yeah talking about upskilling here we, we, we again back to this moment because I'm I want to try to accelerate on some of these things um, you mentioned we're in a state of transformation state of huge change another thing which I think, and we have to talk about some of these tensions, is also about tensions between the traditional academic pathway to having a better life, I think, and, and technology now being accepted to be part of that, I think. And also then the other pathways, the TFET, no training, vocation, education, and training sector, which is, you know, Alessia's world and many of your other worlds, I think. And then somewhere in between, and this is where, and we keep on talking about lifelong learning, and I always find that when I have conversations with people, whether they come from universities or policymakers, we start talking about lifelong learning. It's a good way of, you know, get people off their pedestal. Because if you if you tell people, are you, are you saying we don't need to learn all through our life? Or do we believe that the academic pathway, that if you come up with a master's degree at some stage, you're set for life, you're only going to have one career in your life, where we all need to keep on reinventing ourselves. So I was wondering about this thing, and and normally the way where these two things come together is around the concept of accreditation, recognition of anything from recognition of learning and recognition of skill sets. And, and I'm just wondering about, you know, if anybody wants to come in, potentially Luis, Luis can come in because of the work that he's doing with blockchain credentials and then Perrin as well, in terms of work that she's done in terms of open education, you know, this idea of recognizing learning and and removing the barriers between you know learning that i got via a traditional education institution or learning that i got as a micro credential from somewhere you know because i learned how to do something and i'm 10 years old this pretty much comes back to the kind of coding stuff that i know klaus has been doing with you so this is a free for all if anybody wants to come in and comment on this one luis i mentioned you first so i don't know if you want to lead on this <laughs> one we'll do alex yeah uh, fully agree, uh, and and I said before, uh, uh, let me maybe maybe go because here for me uh, the 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 technological the technological solutions are are there. Uh, there are more legacy existing ones uh, aligned fully aligned with uh, all the all the all the legal frameworks and so on. Uh, there's other one that is also in place. For me, technology is not the the main challenge here. Uh, again, I'm sorry, sorry to go back to that, but, but uh, for my experience in, in one of the of the of the projects that we are working right now, it's called uh, Thirty Digital. Uh, last year, Ministry of Universities here in Spain funded uh, all public universities. Uh, there were, I think, ninety six million euros uh, to allow public universities improve further on 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 their uh, digitalization <laughs> path mm -hmm. um, one of the conditions for to to get to get funded was guys at least you need to define uh, collaborative projects with at least three or more universities mm -hmm. some of them uh, are fully focused. I think 12 of the 47 projects that has been finally funded, 12 of them are fully focused on uh, improving 
the digital uh, capabilities of of uh, of the of all the stakeholders in education from, from university i mean students but also staff but also uh, teachers but also uh, governance bodies and so on uh, uh, others are focused on accreditation and recognition uh, for that of course uh, as as usual i think the the first approach was okay let's try to find the best uh, technology solutions uh, no no that, that that's not the <laughs> that's not the right way to do it mm? so likely we can back and say okay what does it mean from a business perspective and, and that's that's the key point eh? and uh, from a practical perspective it means that we need to break down the existing uh, more traditional learning offering and eh? the master's degree the diploma supplement now we need to go deeper on that and identify eh? what are what kind of, of other types of of, uh, of learning of uh, education that uh, that exists there eh? uh, other, because uh, the, the traditional transcript uh, course contains more granular uh, components. Eh? The, here, there's a learning link with micro credentials, for example. Eh? So we have also the opportunity here to uh, recognize and accreditate, uh, accreditate uh, micro credentials. Micro credentials, you know that there are <laughs> still uh, there's still a pending common and unique formal definition for it. There are several of them, but at least there are some key points that are uh, have been agreed. Eh? One of them is that uh, the co about the key com contents components, like uh, for example, competences and skills eh? and all these kinds of things. So uh, the the hard work here for a higher education for an educational institution and doesn't matter if it's higher or not is how to break down on the learning value chain. Uh, how uh, on defining and identifying the task activities and mapping those activities, those more granular uh, learning units with existing frameworks, uh, competence frameworks, skill frameworks, ones recognized like DICCOM and so on, like ESCO and so on. Uh, and then, of course, uh, with a common uh, way to measure, to accreditate, and to recognize, uh, we have the opportunity to add value to existing learning offering, mm? trying also to align with that existing gap that I agree, there's an existing gap <laughs> with with uh, with uh, the real demand from employers and so on. Mm. Uh, but that can be, I, I, I think it can be addressed. Uh? So there's an opportunity here to do it. Of course, once you have that, you need the underlying technology that enables uh, to provide uh, such uh, accreditation me, and recognition. Yeah. Let me let me interrupt a bit. Um, yeah. Because in a, in a, in a way, I think I'm very concerned about this when when you mentioned that there are a lot of frameworks around you know, digital competence frameworks. You know, in Europe, I also keep yeah. on hearing about European solutions. I think that we need European solutions. And, and yet most learners are looking at other kind of solutions to learn, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily European. So I think I sense that's one of the disconnects. Um, I think this thing about recognizing learning, we're a long way off, I think. You know, even if you look at places like in Africa, you know, most people, and, and you, we're talking about Tibet over there, some of the work I'm doing at UNESCO, most people, young people still want to go and get a degree because that's what they've been deemed to be the gold standard of, of education. So those are challenges. Perin, I mentioned open education, right? Again, the value of open education resources, a bit questionable at this stage. Are they at a par with what you said? Parents complaining that the kids have not been getting the same kind of education, maybe, mm. over the last year? Well, first, I would have loved that my, my children go to any educational content, but they, they still not go to that when they look to a screen. <laughs> Uh, but, however, the, the, the idea of open education uh, is that somebody already paid for you and you shouldn't pay it a second time, you know, whereas uh, to the whole movement needs money, you know, to, to offer complete collections in many ways uh, of uh, educational resources, like in a library, 
uh, if you are attending a university and you go to the library, somebody already paid for you so that you can consult the books. And the idea of open education is that it is it is available and the library is online and you just don't get any advertisement or anything. And you, you, you have a kind of a university uh, library like Wikipedia, but uh, that is labelized. So this is really interesting. And uh, this is due sometimes only to benevolent people who like to share their course. But usually you need much more money because the teacher has become a, a, a project manager. <laughs> so it's a new job for him and new skills. And he he needs to be supported with infographics and, and uh, uh, instructors. Instru I, I never know how to say that word in English, but designers who help them build the, the course uh, with the technology. So in the end, they do need uh, project funding from uh, from uh, usually uh, public uh, from the public funding, uh, and these are our taxes. So it's normal that then you uh, open the license because of course you you put your intellectual knowledge. However, it becomes something that is uh, that you were paid for, and that that is um, together that is uh, really helpful. For I guess um, soon, and due to uh, all these uh, interesting ideas of of uh, getting lifelong learning libraries uh, that are available to any citizens, there will be a strong support in France at least. For, for a complete library of uh, knowledge that is uh, freely available uh, for anyone uh, who is in, this, in that system. I hope so. And uh, it will be really interesting. And how you all know, it doesn't mean it's free because you, get to, you must have this recognition and this credential at some point that you have learned and that you were assessed as good. So... This Sorry, is where, me... again, uh, someone has to pay. Is it from your wallet directly? I mean, from your own money? Or is it uh, uh, organized by the state, you know, this lifelong learning and, and, and employers uh, will, will pay for it? But in the end, uh, it will help, definitely. Okay, I've been made aware that we, literally, we have to tail off by 11.15. So I'm going to accelerate and I want to get to the other side. Which is the whole thing about digital skills. Okay. So we're told in a post COVID world, learners and professionals, you know, we have to cope with a range of different skill sets. But most programs, curricula, have not been amended to reflect any of these. In other words, something happened, but we're still struggling with the old. So, how do we address this now? Also, knowing that many of the people in the panel are in the business of training, a lot of you haven't are in contact with industry, you know, how can training contribute to the skills which are needed in, in the labor market? Um, so here, I'm, not, you know, again, you know, we, we know something's broken. We know we can do something about it with technology. We, we, what do we do in the short time that we have, knowing that many people are still harking for the old normal? I'm open to comments. Alessia, I think, and, and, and Klaus should have something to say about this. And I think so should Martin and Claudia. Yeah. And if we can keep these to about one minute each, please, because otherwise, you know, I'd like to get everybody to speak. So, Alessia. Well, yeah. Um, what I can say is that I completely agree. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the COVID pushed us uh, to, to quickly move uh, from. Uh, face-to-face uh, -to, -face, uh, to online, and then uh, we were acting in an emergency context. Definitely acting in a digital system. Uh, I mean, I'm a technology and learning expert, so I've been working on in this uh, since also even before COVID, and I'm a full uh, technology enthusiast. And I can say that technology and working in online environment enable us to work more and respond on the demands of learners. So I can tweak more easily, I can, I can be more flexible no? to respond to the needs of learners. But it costs a lot of fatigue <laughs> to be <laughs> uh, re to responding to needs in a flexible way. Uh, from a training point of view, what I can say is that the pandemic taught us 
uh, at least as a training center in a context where we can we are allowed uh, a certain flexibility to move from a model where we were working mostly on a catalog training type of model and switching more to uh, uh, services type of uh, type of business model allow me to uh, use the business even though we are not uh, coming from the private sector industry so we're moving more from to a model where we use uh, advisory service product development and custom training so that we are creating products and programs jointly with our stakeholders and constituents and uh, um, I was telling you that uh, before pandemic, uh, I used to be in charge of a uh, numbers of uh, training activity that was were offered on catalog and people could apply and select, you know, from our constituents. Now uh, on catalog, I only been in charge of one training activity that is, you know, open to to general public. The rest is uh, custom made and tailor made. Having said that, uh, still, um, you know, I'm looking for the magic formula to see how I can. Uh, optimize the process in a way that it's not uh, uh, so time consuming and uh, cost effective on our side because being tailor made uh, requires a lot of effort. I'm looking for two more contributions on this one of about one minute each. Does anybody have any feedback from what Alessia has been saying? Klaus, Claudia? Yep. Maybe if I, sorry Claudia, would, would you like to go? Yeah. Okay. Just um, yeah, like I mean, like like Alessia. I mean, uh, I, I I've been um, a technology freak all my life. So uh, seeing the panic around COVID and so on when it comes to technology was sometimes a little bit amusing as well. But um, what what I think has uh, what what worries me a little bit in this discussion is just like you said, Alex, um, this reference to, you know, we need to create European models, we need to create European frameworks. It's this sort of drive towards a big top-down bureaucratic approach that somehow magically is going to fix all this. And I think the fundamental problem with this is that we think there is an end game. So if we put in place the right things, we can do a certain set of steps and then we're done. And we've solved the digital divide problem or the digital skills problem in Europe or in the world. And that flies in the face of the fundamental reality that change is constant. And we will never have an end position we can, we can arrive at. And I think this is a fundamental problem that is not being really addressed. Because it goes against what we normally do in academia as well. In academia, we set a curriculum, we set a syllabus. This is going to last us for the next 20 years, 10 years, 15 years. And then we stop worrying about it. And the problem is that the rate of change is, 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 is what is constantly accelerating, which means that the longevity of any program we put in place is decreasing inversely all the time as well. So I think that that creates a very, very interesting dynamic we need to think about. And reinventing the wheel every few years and creating new big platforms and, and digital um, frameworks and quality frameworks and all of that is I think a fool's game. I, I do not think we should get into that. I think what we should do instead is look much at much closer integration between the digital skills that are required in industry to work with industry to map those out into curriculum related courses, items and so on that can be linked directly into ongoing academia and curriculum. And to make sure that at the end of the day, I mean, what is education about? I think a big part of education, I, I think someone mentioned it for too, is making sure that learners are happier at the end. And I think a big part of being happier is being competent in the world you're going to live in. And to me, it is unconscionable today that, for example, I work with a lot of Erasmus interns, you know, 16, uh, sorry, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old students who come from vocational colleges, universities sometimes on internship exchanges. And to me, it is shocking that, for example, you can have somebody graduating as a system administrator who has never done at school cloud computing. Klaus, we, I'm, I'm being told, you know, we've, we've got stopwatch now. So this yeah. is in a way not, re not real life for those of us who lecture in that, you know, it's real life when you have somebody outside you're lecturing and they're coming you know, putting your head outside the window and saying, time up, time up. Um, we've got about five, 
five minutes to go. Um, so if Claudia and and uh, and Martin need you know want to say something about what's been happening, now's the time to to do it. Um, um, and I'm 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 going to go back partly also to something which in a way Delphor all had to grapple with at the beginning, which was so what do you do about the technology? I mean, ever since we started this project, for instance, um, a lot of the talk now is about metaverse, AI. You know, we won't be doing this anymore. We'll all be, you know, if you believe Zuckerberg, we'll, we'll be wearing these headsets. We'll all be able to, I'll be able to know who's, you know, whose attention span is there or not. So again, I keep on wondering about how all of these things pivot within things like, and I only have questions now, and I suspect that's what we need. We need to keep on asking these questions, you know, how are, how are training institutions changing to provide relevant training on emerging tech to fast track so-called digital skills? Can governments really buy into the concept of, say, decentralized technologies? Well, most of the business of governments is centralization, power, okay? Um, can centralization versus decentralization issues just be resolved by technology? I was having a conversation with Klaus about this, I think, you know, a couple of days ago, you know, or do institutions need to have other skills? And I know Klaus has said, how about we start to invest in leadership skills in organizations? as opposed to just technologies. I also freak out about the idea that, you know, and that we're losing any relationship with social sciences, with humanities, with things like history, because unless we understand the problems of the past, we can't even understand, you know, what we have to do. So, Claudia, I think you had something to say before I interrupted you, and then uh, um, yeah. I'll ask all of you guys to, to, to round up, go. I can tie it up very, very quickly. So Klaus, I agree with what you said before. Um, making the the like arc back to what we heard at the very beginning, the vision of the digital decade and for all sectors, not just education. And also this all um, that Rihanna said at the beginning about the um, the recovery and resilience plans and then the 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 connectivity everyone in uh, the European Union should should somehow have the everything at their fingertips. I think in that case we will move to a world where um, where everyone has the potential and and uh, at so to say like at at their fingertips they have the access to technology. They don't need to understand everything that is underneath, for example, by the blockchain. They can be using the blockchain for their certifications or whatever it is, but um, it will be there. The data, the data spaces we Hannah talked about, all that will be there. And we just make have to make sure that this, this divide doesn't, doesn't get bigger, this digital divide that you also. So, We've got two minutes left. Does any one of you feel compelled that we should have spoken about other things and we haven't spoken about them? This is your elevator pitch now, I guess, 20 seconds each. Are we all just going to talk to each other for the next three years and hope somebody else does the heavy lifting and the hard work? And what can policymakers in the EU do to help out, knowing that education is the prerogative of the member states? Okay, Alex. So I'm, I'll, I'll say something provocative here. My opinion is technology is not the, prob the problem. Uh, I think Luis said this very elegantly earlier on. And I think the longer we focus on the technology, the longer we are going to ignore the real problem, which is basically we need to invest in people. We need to get much better at communicating. Uh, again, we need to take a leaf out of business. Our sales pitch to educators, to the general public, to learners needs to be way better than it is now. Why we should be bothering with technology or technology enhanced learning. And it is not about the technology. Uh, technology will rise to the challenge whenever we correctly identify a problem. The problem is we don't always do that. And um, focusing on technology, I think, is not the, the answer. 
Okay. And if I may add to that, I think uh, there is a, is a very big role uh, to think about the ethics of uh, technology uh, that need to be covered as well. There's uh, from social science, a fantastic field, science and technology uh, studies that uh, already uh, sheds a lot of light on terms of how technology is shaping society. And so I think that uh, is uh, should be part of any curriculum uh, as well to actually make sure that uh, we understand technology in the broader sense. Thank you all, all of you, for joining us. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Thank Bye you, all. all the panelists. And uh, uh, I don't know, not many attendees are here, so I suppose many have already left this session, but I've already written in the chat. So we take a short break for 15 minutes, and uh, then we are back at about 11.30 in the next session. So just please go on the agenda and click, you know, join in the next session, you know, towards uh, towards a more resilient digital pedagogy education system. This is the session that will start. It will start at 11.20, but uh, no worries. We will be back at 11.30. So just take a 15 minutes <laughs> break. Uh, we turn off our cameras and mute ourselves and see each other in a few minutes time. See you soon. Bye. This is uh, our uh, the next session towards a more resilient uh, digital pedagogy education system, lessons from the Dell for all community. And uh, so uh, let me start like how we began. We, bega we began in the uh, January 2020 when uh, with the new vision of the project for upcoming technologies and, uh, uh, you know, consolidate uh, what uh, with a vision to research and map and consolidate the technologies used in the digital learning. Uh, like the blockchain, AI, and AI technologies. But soon afterwards, the pandemic started and brought upon the entire world a completely new set of challenges where education as we know it uh, had to be changed. So uh, this led to new challenges where screen time first was prohibited and reduced in the past. And then the, in the pandemic, that was the only way education had to continue uh, via the digital platforms. So this changed the scope of the project also. Uh, and during the course of the project, we interacted with Dell for all community of experts and uh, gained from their experience, knowledge and, and uh, practices what they are doing to adapt uh, with this change. So we interacted with our experts via surveys, interviews, events, workshops, and most recently during the weekly coffee chat sessions. And uh, now I'm going to play you a video where you will see the snapshots from the various interactions with the, with the experts and, and learn what and how they have adapted uh, to this change. When you create an e-learning course, you have a lot of challenges creating a learning environment, which is interesting and engaging for the learner and uh, sometimes you see you have uh, this one technology would, would best fit uh, this problem and then you have another learning technology would best fit another problem so in combining them all together you can get the both best of every world and just choose which part of it you need until the corona crisis we repeatedly decided against online solutions as on the one hand from our point of view, the risk of deception by the participants was too high. And on the other hand, questions of security and privacy were not sufficiently solved, solved with regard to the GDPR. I believe uh, in the future, the main use case would be uh, something similar to Alexa, but in learning uh, industry, so everyone will be able to say to his phone or a laptop like, uh, Alexa, could you please find uh, like uh, VTO research um, for 2020, for example, and receive this uh, directly on the laptop without uh, the necessity to type the, in this information in Google and uh, um, review like 10 or 10 websites just to find the, um, uh, the required report. In a physical presence, yes, yeah? so the students uh, meet at our um, lecture rooms, yeah, and then they meet in groups, yeah, and then the uh, supervisors go from group to group, yeah, they listen to the groups, they talk with the groups, yeah, and this element is missing in the digital course, yeah, and um, somehow uh, if you have a physical presence, by nature you have a kind of a control of the students, yeah, you can give them advice, yeah, and this is missing, yeah. And uh, if you transfer in this one 
to a Zoom meeting, um, that will not really work, yeah, because uh, you can't interact with the students in the Zoom room, yeah, as you do in a physical present. We use artificial intelligence to make data sets uh, manageable for the end user, so to speak. Um, in, in particular, we use skills taxonomies, for example, the, the um, EU's ESCO um, framework, which is sort of the European Skills and Competencies um, model, is comprised of uh, not less than 13,500 skills and 3,000 uh, occupations in relation to each other, um, trying to com compile a, a skill profile out of that information for the individual. The best thing for us to do is to focus on pushing in blockchain through education, educating the students, educating the various individuals in governance. How can blockchain change various services? Um, in Malta, that, that is exactly what we're trying to do now. So we're trying to have real world use cases that impact the individuals. Now, the educational certificate is brilliant. It's pretty normal that when technologies are early adopted, um, they are normally taken with diffidence, with a lot of criticism. And well, I think it's just a matter of the historicity of us being exposed to this kind of computer interactions in a number of social situations, rather than them being suitable or not suitable. The problem is not that the teachers don't want to use games. Um, I think most of the teachers are eager uh, to use games. Uh, but there, I think they find um, a lot of practical problems, like where to find games, like we said before. Um, how to, to run the games in the classroom without needing a whole technical thing behind them. If we don't train children in technology today, their prospects of finding jobs in the future may be impacted because a lot of those jobs need technology. But I, but I think it is very, very important that in every discussion about technology in education, we don't just focus on the aspect of how will this improve, for example, student engagement, or how will this improve, you know, uh, access to education and, and so on. I think one of the critical themes that has not been dealt with enough, or, or at all in many cases, is quality of life. The importance of digital self-sovereignty is, of course, uh, it extends far beyond uh, education um, because we are right now um, not only rethinking the purpose of the university so who is the university for and to what end um, but we also are at a crossroads when it comes to digital privacy people learning while they work and using the accreditation of that learning to, to enhance their careers so around this, we're looking at trans transparent and immutable accreditation, which is um, transportable um, across Europe. We're looking at um, if we can um, supply personalized recommendations to individuals, and can we have personal and professional progression? In terms of basic digital literacies, yes, I think there's a lot more uh, work that needs to be done uh, and a lot of emphasis on that and I think you're seeing that um, not only say for example you know the ILO is involved in um, its own decent jobs for youth global initiative and there, there's quite a lot of attention paid to digital skills development uh, in Africa at the moment a continental wide initiative with the African Union and the African Development Bank and the ILO. There is a tendency with digital learning that one tends to think quite quickly about this box idea and we need to make sure that we're breaking open these boxes and we break them open by um, firstly having the rights to do that and that's why you need uh, openly licensing and then the capability that's why you need the the open tech that's part of the trick of being a school online teacher versus um, being perhaps a university online teacher. As a school teacher, you are still trying to teach them these skills. So you can't just give them the platform and then leave them to get on with it. You've got to um, structure it, frame it, guide them, um, and also give them some access to perhaps um, surveys that help them self-reflect. If you go uh, like one step further, then one of the big issues is that uh, the innovators just don't have the possibility even to be included in the dialogue. So 
and and there is of course uh, one thing that is mentioned in the vision document as well is that we need to have a microservices based architecture um so people i mean as small teams as as i don't know one two three five people teams would be also welcomed with their solutions what's important for us is to understand that still human being is in the center and we are building um, with emerging technologies to support the human being and not to replace anything. And I think this is often misunderstood that um, technologies are replacing us in some sort, but I personally have seen that it's not working. Thank you. Thank you for watching and uh... So, uh, can you hear me still? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Claudia. Uh, so, uh, I will quickly go on to this uh, session with presentation. And here we present you with the findings of the project, the matrix research agenda, best, best practices, and the policy recommendation. So, I invite on stage first, uh, I welcome Ashling Third. She's a research fellow at the Open University. You can will present the metrics. After her presentation, uh, Claudia Farkas will present the research agenda. Uh, Claudia is a senior researcher and project manager at the Commonwealth Center for Connected Learning and uh, Foundation, Connected Learning Foundation in Malta. Uh, after her presentation, Ashling will be back again and present the best practices. And finally, uh, our colleague uh, Georgios Tubekis, who is a researcher at the Fraunhofer Institute of Applied Information Technology, will present the policy recommendations. I also request all these speakers to kindly speak about yourself for a, few, uh, for a minute or two so that you introduce yourself better than I, I have done. And uh, thank you. And I stop sharing my screen and uh, the floor is all yours, uh, Ashling. Thank you, Amika. Um, hi, yes, uh, my name is Ashling. I work at the Open University in the UK, so I'm I mean, I always struggle to actually say what I am because I don't know why, but I work in a technology research lab, um, but I have quite a mixed academic background. Um, but yes, my, my sort of general focus is on uh, using technology to make, uh, to make a difference. Um, and in various ways, uh, my main focus I think is on sort of empowering individuals and allowing complex systems to work together and that's important because <laughs> it's sort of informed how uh you approach this so yeah that's kind of me um so i'm going to try and share my screen this is a little technically weirder than normal but let's try can you see my slide Yes, yes perfect. Okay, yes. good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yes, so uh, this is, uh, so I have two presentations now. I think this one is somewhat the more, uh, I guess, slightly mechanical one. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's uh, quite fundamental to how we've gone about this project. So I'm going to talk about something that I think echoes what I've heard quite a lot this morning and something that has been absolutely resounding from talking to people in the community is to um not just talk about technology but to talk about its educational context to situate it in educational practice and essentially so the focus of this uh this presentation really is to talk about how we've um approached uh, how to think about that, how to how a uh, framework for for modeling it, dealing with it. Um, so uh, initially, so these were our sort of our initial goals, very, very sort of broadly summarized for this aspect of work within Dell for all, is to look at um, the relationship between technology, advanced technologies, as um, I, I will speak about probably in the second presentation, um, and their application. In education and uh, mapping between them. So, if you, you know, how do you, what are the relationships between different technologies, different educational applications, and use cases? And obviously, not, you know, necessarily particular technologies, although, yes, particular, 
you know, you don't know a particular piece of software so I work at your university. We've had a obviously heated coding, which uh, in which we've developed a, a tool called LinkChains, which is for issuing of verified credentials using blockchains as a backing. That's a very particular technology. Our colleagues at Fraunhofer Fit have a platform called Blockchain for Education, which is about um, issuing verifiable educational credentials using blockchains for backing. Uh, they're not necessarily different in the sense of their educational application. Okay, this is blockchain verified certification, and there are many other things that's quite highly space at the moment. Um, and they have different focuses and goals. Uh, but um, my, my goal with my work at the Open University is about uh, general things to do with um, decentralized data and trust. It's not necessarily of interest to its application in a school directly. Indirectly, yes, but not necessarily. But from an um, educational point of view, that's what this sort of thing is used for. So we don't necessarily need to talk about individual bits of software or individual tools or platforms, but um, it's quite good to look at a more generalized scale and see. Um, and so given that those kind of goal, then to identify technological activities in the space of digital education, uh, things like you know, research projects or uh, software projects, companies, systems, uh, policy initiatives, those sorts of things, and also experts. Uh, and to connect um, the digital education activities and experts to <clears throat> actual applications in the world. So to group them into the sort of families to map together. So then, um, that's this concept of the Del for All technology versus education matrix. So take the different technologies and education answers and experts and give a structure. This was the initial goal to give a structure to map onto the other view of the landscape uh, and see how we do. Now, in reality, it became very, very clear very early on that this was quite a coarse way of looking at things and really the value in mapping the educational landscape is to understand context is to break down uh who what where how etc of how people are using technology in education now that would fit better with what seems to be emerging as the the needs of practitioners um in the space uh, this was before, so we put, as been said a number of times, the project started in January 2020, uh, and then it all went very different. Um, but we were thinking along these lines before, but it became very much to the fore as COVID hit. But so I'm going to go through an uh, example of how we've been thinking about context and what seemed to emerge about context. I'm going to use this is the not slight, I mean. This is a real example, okay, so I went to the Open University, we're quite an unusual education institution, uh, purely distant scenario since the uh, end of the 1960s, beginning of the 1960s, 1970, and um, with blended learning with face-to-face -face tutors and resources, uh, initially sent out by post, but obviously now an awful lot of So this is a somewhat fictionalised version of the example, it's not uh, a real one, but it's better for explaining uh, the sort of context I'm talking about. So I'm going to talk about the learning context that my university uh, operates in. Okay, so we deal with adult learners, by and large, those are the people who are learning. Uh, most of the actual um, active teaching by a human, if there's a lot of self-study, but most of the active teaching is done by a tutor, a higher education tutor. Uh, it is uh, the overall setting for the whole thing, it's distance higher education. Uh, and we had yes, like I said, we have a blended learning approach. Traditionally, not the last couple of years, but traditionally students do meet face to face with someone local to them regularly, uh, every few weeks or every month. Uh, the um, <clears throat> we do various uh, sort of thing um, types of of learning activity, but for example, one of the things we do is we actually deliver teaching. So we have. Uh, um, learning outcomes we want to achieve, we have uh, materials to help us do that, and uh, we actually go through the process of getting those two students, essentially. And we have a number of uh, 
other sort of stakeholders who would come up with various elements and how we do things, like the companies, or the universities, those kinds of things. So that's an example of um, the sort of factors that I sort of summarize the context in which we operate, <coughs> more or less. And so generalizing these, uh, we sort of modeled the, con the idea broadly of a learning context. We didn't just generalize from the EU stuff, by the way, I'm just using this to illustrate. Um, but the concept of things we want to know are to determine what is uh, practical terms, what is a broad context where something is happening in education, learner type, educator type, learning settings could be like a school, could be like evening classes, could be self-study online, could be MOOC, could be just doing your job, um, etc. Uh, pedagogy, I'm going to talk a bit about pedagogy today, as quite a lot of people have already. Um, learning activity, what is it you're actually doing? What aspect of education are we doing? Are we talking about um, accreditation, uh, assessment? Are we talking about, uh, and it's that formative or summative? Are we talking about creating materials to teach from or creating resources or using them? Um, those sorts of things. And uh, there are often other stakeholders in place, so we want to look like that. Um, so that concept, I would think we'd say is, uh, we'd call this a, a learning context. And then in terms of collecting information about what's going on out there, when we're looking at what activities are happening, what experts are there, uh, I, this is one of the more fictional bits, right? So the OU learning platform isn't really accessible outside, but I want to give an example, and there are several of them. But uh, the OU learning platform is a technology. It, uh, is applied in this context. Okay, so that's one example. Now, Coursera, very similar in a lot of ways. It's all distance, it's, it's now all online. Uh, they don't do blended learning, okay, because that takes people. Um, so uh, the Coursera learning context might be the same in many respects. So adult learners, um, distance higher education, okay, they don't use higher education teachers. Um, uh, or other than they might for course production, um, et cetera. But there are differences. So this sometimes is a related but different learning context. And by breaking down the context like this, we can actually narrow down where the similarities are, where the differences are for analysis. So uh, that's what we do. Now, as it happens at the OU, we have a couple of learning platforms, one of which is uh, open to anyone and can be used and does not involve tutors. We actually, in some senses, use the same learning context as the uh, for some of our activities. So we operate in two learning contexts. That's fine. Or any number more than that. We can have. Uh, so this would be linking, that would be linking activities to learning context. And then also we're collecting information about experts. Experts also operate and know about different contexts. So we want to map them to the same sorts of Hence, to identify, well, actually, this person, this person could be my friend Tina from Berlin. Uh, she, um, the person, Tina Papadoma, um, she uh, is an expert in uh, online pedagogy and um, uh, did quite a lot of work on MOOC, and approaches to MOOC design, and so on. Uh, she knows both of these platforms, she's an expert in these, so we can connect her to these line of contacts. And that's how we've gone about sort of modeling of um, attaching technologies, people to, uh, or things being done with technologies, people to where those things are happening, how those things are happening, who they're happening with, et cetera, to help us um, analyze these. And as I was talking earlier about abstraction and trying to find common things, one thing we can do is generalize and say, well, okay, so open online learning platforms like Coursera. Uh, like some of the activities at the university, uh, as a general type of thing to be done with web technologies. Um, and it's done in these contexts. And then you can sort of look at how, what else falls under that banner for a start, what the commonalities are for, excuse me, different uses of application, and also backwards from looking from, well, actually, I'm in a, uh, particular context and I want to find out what would be helpful 
to me, then I can figure that out. And so we ex to expand this concept of the technology versus education matrix, this is a sort of summary view of this. I actually don't think it's necessarily the the main use for the data we have, but it, it's, it's a good way of getting a view of the landscape, is to have, now in this sense, like I say, I'm doing a summary table, so have a something connecting an example of uh, the use of technology, so um, adaptation of content, automatic adaptation of content to tailor things to different audiences, which is the use of artificial intelligence in technology, uh, applied for content creation, which has various stakeholders, but primarily whoever it is who's creating the content, it may not be an institution, an educational institution, um, whoever it is, is using them, which may be an institution, they don't have to be the same thing, but these are the participants are um, having natural language generation to automate content. There is some uh, research going on in using that to uh, scale online teaching, essentially. So where we don't necessarily have the human um, numbers to be able to have enough teachers to do things online. Are there certain things that can be answered by bots and how by bots that can allow students to explore things? And certain control groups. So now that is not something one would use face to face. So that's only online learning and its settings. It's about the delivery of content. Uh, you can use it in blended learning uh, as well as online. Um, so this is a different. Stakeholder of content creator have their own benefits and challenges. And this is a way to. Um, just to view what's going on. Ooh, my video is frozen in a terrible expression, sorry. Um, and to serve as a basis for uh, navigating and, anal and analyzing the landscape. So if you wanted to use this, so to frame things, I mean, I would rather actually to honest, not call it technology versus education, but education to technology. So if you think education comes first. So, you know, you could say, well, I have a problem, right? I'm, I'm a learner. And I want to achieve something, or I'm a teacher, and I want to achieve something, and this is where I am, this is what's going on. How can I find something to help me? Uh, or how can I find something that's, that's useful to me? Uh, so I can look for contexts that are similar to mine or the same as mine, uh, and look at what's being done there and take things and adapt them and use them uh, or connect with them. Um, the two, if you're a researcher in the areas, if you're a policymaker, you might want to try and group things together to fit the sort of context of the future you're looking at, and this is a way to navigate and find them. Um, or also vice versa, you might have come up with something, you might have come up with a way to do something. You might be a secondary school teacher who's, you know, produced some really good resources for your classes, pulling together different online open educational resources, for example, and you want to, you want to share that. And you can uh, express what you've done, you can say well look, this is the context I've, I've put it into application and this is how it went and that then could allow you to structure how you share things how you can create a new open educational resource for example for other people to pick up and use which as has been mentioned already with me is quite uh, important or um, increasingly important how it is um another use so just to kind of end with something a little bit uh more accessible <laughs> because Okay, so this is somewhat the more technical presentation. Um, but the underlying data for this, so we have a lot of data of activities, we have a lot of data experts uh, categorized like this, connected to different contexts, and we can run analyses on that underlying data. And one of the things uh, Audrey, who is, I see is attending here, um, has been doing is rather than manually uh, grouping things together and clustering them, which has been a lot of this activity, uh, using AI ourselves uh, on just the descriptions of different um, projects and different initiatives to uh, identify common topics among them. So we've been applying some topic modeling on on these things automatically and sort of the best way to kind of show, so this is I guess the bottom up topic, this is starting from what's out there, what texts are on websites describing these, these projects for example and what are the common and interesting words that these things be by 
And by doing that, so you end up getting collections of words like this. So this is one of the topics that's uh, already identified um, about coding, computers, interactive tools. This is for kids, but it's primarily language learning. Okay, so this group, a set of activities that identified are uh, connected to um, languages, and it's not clearly not just coding languages. It's got uh, um, human ones there as well. So, but technologies being used in this area are grouped together, uh, can be grouped together, and we can run some analysis on those. So, for example, by these topics. So, down the left, you, I don't know if you can read it, but there are uh, some of these different topics. So, students, academic, uh, helping course. So, that's a very simple analysis. This is how many activities we identified in that topic, 35. The biggest one, learning, learner. So, this is just broadly educator here. This is tools that relate to the delivery of education to, to platforms to help that. Uh, there's not really very much under virtual environments, online virtual environments, right? nine projects in that. Uh, this is very, like I say, very crude analysis, but that's the sort of thing you can look at and do um, more interesting things with uh, using this kind of model. And use that broadly for policy for practicality for research as a way of exploring and mapping the landscape what's going on and um, i'll give a my next presentation after areas i will um give what i hope is a more uh illustrative example of that that will make more sense in that context but yes that's broadly very quick summary of how we've approached the contextualizing of education in educational technology and education. So um, thank you. Any, any questions or discussion? Thank you, Ashley. That was a very good explanation of the matrix. And uh, yes, uh, if there are any questions, uh, please write them in the live discussion chat uh, or else. We move to the next presentation, and I invite uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Claudia Farkas, and uh, she will be talking about my explaining you about the research agenda. Uh, Claudia, may you please uh, start your video? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, all yours. Thank you very much. I will try to share my screen, but I think, Ashlyn, you have to stop sharing before I can. Uh -huh. now let's see if I can share it. And I also would need a feedback if you see the slides. Not yet, but yes, but it's not in the presentation mode. But yes, I'm just going to switch to there. Perfect. And do you see it? And yes. You see it perfectly full size, right? Yes, full screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. Welcome to the session on the DARE Research Agenda. My name is Claudia Georgi Farkas, and I'm the Senior Researcher and Project Manager at the Commonwealth Center for Connected Learning Foundation in Malta. Within DARE for All, I work as a task leader on this specific topic, the DARE Research Agenda. Just to set the scene, right at the DARE for All project start, we run into the COVID-19 pandemic, making everything we planned face to face basically impossible but of course it wasn't just us hit by the pandemic uh, it was at the same time all the pedagogical approaches started to understand that the face-to-face -face teaching cannot be just mirrored online and as a response to these issues at therefore all we modified our objectives and um, we started to look at a wider set of technologies and to understand the teaching models and pedagogies in the online learning atmosphere. But unexpectedly, the pandemic did not end. So in the second year of the COVID, we had to face new other issues like Zoom fatigue and survey fatigue. Both the education sector and also the research fields realized that actual attendance at events or responses to surveys are decreasing day by day. So to further mitigate the negative outcomes on our work, we again refined our research approach by mainly pivoting to two-dimensional surveys, 
redesigning our project research, work packages and deliverables, and constantly scanning for any or any new European Commission's policy and strategy developments. In the same time, we also redesigned the second version of the research agenda to set the ground for the work for the best practices deliverable and for both to feed into the findings of the roadmap and policy recommendation, hoping to understand the issues from different angles. The best practices deliverable builds upon the collective use cases from the first version of the research agenda, while the roadmap and policy recommendation deliverable builds upon the outcomes of the first and the second version of the research agenda and the best practices all to collect recommendation at the European Commission level. I'm not sure if I switch to or just no, that's perfect. So during the two-dimensional methodology of data collection, we used open-ended questions in our surveys and also at our interviews, webinars, and workshops. And you can see that marked in activities one. And we prepared statements from the answers got from these and used them in the second phase as closed response survey and discussions at large events such as ECTEL or LearnTech. And this is marked under activities three and four. Here, experts were presented with the statements and asked to identify those they consider to be significant for the topic at hand. The results were then used to rank the statements to see the most important priorities suggested by the expert community. And feeding back to the original strategy priorities, as you can see in activities one, together with the collection of best practices marked in activities too. Well, the data collection was based on qualitative research methods and builds upon waves of analysis, including market intelligence, desk research, community discussions, all to challenge preconceptions, fine tune our findings and develop informed conclusions. Most of our stakeholders activities were online due to the ongoing uh, pandemic and putting a great effort to bring together an engaged community of practice to understand how education can continue and adapt to the future even after the pandemic. Well, in the first year of the project, so everything you've seen before under activities one, we collected data about the challenges, opportunities and priorities, what the COVID-19 pandemic added on digital learning in higher education. This exercise resulted in a set of statements to each one of our three areas, so the challenges, opportunities and priorities. Then we marked the overlaps between the challenges and priorities as they indicate in both the issue and the expected action points addressed to the European Commission. And this resulted in 12 prioritized challenges you can see on the screen. In parallel to this analysis, we directed our attention to the outcomes of only the priorities elements of our three area. So again, the challenges, opportunities and priorities and created our strategic priorities. This was done using text analysis tools to identify clusters then groupings for the statements. And we presented them to the expert community, asking them to prioritize the list of statements. The outcomes, the three strategic priority categories on the left side are ranked according to the expert responses. Um, after that, as a further test, we checked how aligned those are to the European Commission's Digital Education Action Plan, what you can see on the right side. And as you can see, comparing our results and the Digital Education Action Plan, we can say that we identified one additional priority area focusing on students' experience, and the other one are quite well aligned um, with the Digital Education Action Plan. One of them is talking about the high quality digital ecosystem and the other one on digital skills and competencies. But further to this, if we, if remove, if we remove the three titles from, from the other uh, presentation slide and you just look into the inputs to each categories, 
We can also say that we identified additional inputs to the objectives compared to the Digital Education Action Plan. And the list here with these 17 entries, they all summarizes the research areas identified as prioritized by the DAFRO community above and beyond the Digital Education Action Plan. To summarize the outcomes, we can conclude that digital pedagogy, lifelong learning, and equity in front of the digital divide are the three most important areas for the expert community. And that should be reflected and prioritized in future research activities. These recommendations from our experts will be used as a base for our further policy recommendation deliverable, focusing on the correlation between the findings and the existing and future policy and strategy developments. Please feel free to ask any questions here on the, on the chat or via email, and please have a look at the full report on the DELFORO website under the resources menu point deliverables D3.5 research agenda, but I'm also going to add the link to the chat. And I'm going to stop sharing my slides. And I'm going to pass back the floor to Ashlyn. But please let me know if you have any questions. No questions. So Amrita uh, or Ashling, I'm not sure which one of you will take over. I'm not sure if it could be me. Looks like. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wait, I see a question in the chat. So, oh, we'll... okay, let's see. I'm not seeing it flashing up. Ram has asked, were there any concerns or policy recommendations around the effectiveness of digital learning, measurement of teaching pedagogy, or improvement in student absorption? Let's see, I'm still looking for the chat question. Uh -huh, I got it now. Okay. What are the concerns? Okay. Hmm. It's a very good question. And I think um, if we will arrive to the recommendation part, which will be Yorgos' presentation, I think we can see more on this one. But yes, I would say yes. I need to I need to look into the question even deeper. So yes, there are concerns definitely on policy recommendation and the digital learning we can see that is not working on the way as we all hoped that it will. Um, definitely improvements are necessary in the pedagogy. But of course, without skills and reskilling or upskilling if students are not understanding the systems or they don't know how to use digital tools that is definitely really hard on both sides so both on educators and both on the on the students as well i'm trying to scroll if there are any other questions but please yorgos on your recommendation uh, deliverable please feedback to this this question if you can if you have answers in yours. Amrita. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Claudia, for your presentation. And I think it's again Ashling who is presenting the, the best practices. It would be, but I now see two new questions have popped up in the chat. So I don't know. <laughs> Let me check. <laughs> yes. Claudio, do you see the questions? May I yes, I'm you? try yes, yes, I'm trying to open on the side, but I can I can see. So okay, I think so this is a question from, from Klaus. Yes. So have you seen, have any, you seen tangible any tangible initiatives to make hybrid learning or hybrid learning options the new normal in education systems around Europe? I think we can always say yes. So the new ways will be definitely towards hybrid learning because we can see if everything goes only online, then it doesn't work. If we try to use face-to-face, -face, that is impossible. And if you try to translate face-to-face -face into online, that's also not going to work. So definitely uh, the new norm is going towards hybrid learning. But the issue is how education institutions will handle them 
without all the infrastructure. So I'm not, I, it's, it's very interesting that some universities, for example, they are well prepared, like let's say Open University, who is always been teaching online for them is quite norm, normal but for others who never use them is is kind of difficult but if teachers are not trained how to use technologies then they don't know how to teach to use them to students so hybrid definitely would be would be the best way there is another Thank question. Thank you, Claudia. Right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> There's Thank a question you. from uh, uh, Professor Ramachandran. I think Ram Ramachandran. Yes. Was it was it in the development of the course content and material itself, or just in the infrastructure? He asks. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure um, if I understand um, development of the course content and material. We do, we did not develop. With regard to the uh, concerns or policy recommendations around effectiveness with teaching. Okay. Uh -huh. Yes, probably. And I, I think then Yorgos will be able to answer this more than me. But in the research agenda, we did not see that. So the course of content and also the infrastructure, the missing infrastructure was marked. So it looks like we are lacking in both. Yorgos, you are muted. Wait. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the regard, yes, the um, the lack of um, this type of assessments, I would say, uh, is definitely something raised. And um, I would say even the limited knowledge probably is here a major issue that um, uh, because there exists um, self-assessment uh, tools, uh, a quite variety even, and um, I think the limited knowledge on these type of tools, uh, and uh, they are not so widespread use as well, I think is something, um, but I would cover this in my part at the end. I'm just going to look back to the chat if there is anything. No. There isn't, there aren't any more questions. No. Okay, then Amrita. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Uh, and also, I uh, thank you for the, uh, to the attendees for raising the questions. It's it's really important that we have an interactive discussions and get your feedback or, you know, your, know your opinion on, on the work that we have done. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's a point of uh, validation for us, this, uh, this event. Uh, so now, uh, thank you, Claudia, so much. And I'll ask uh, Ashling uh, for the next yes. presentation, Finding Best Practices in the Post-COVID World. Uh, Ashling, the floor is all yours. Thank you. So, yes, I'm back. Um, <clears throat> let me just bring my presentation up so we can see this one. And just to check again, you can see the full slide. Thank you, Ashling. Um, okay, so yes, uh, the other element of the um, project work uh, I have been reading is about the, the question of best practice. Uh, and uh, again, I think this um, concept has necessarily changed during the project because of what's been going on. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is just kind of outline uh, some of the things essentially really, that we found um, from various uh, activities with communities with regard to the topic of best practice for digital education. Uh, so uh, once again, I'm going to start out with what our goals were at the beginning. Okay, so the project was intended to be focused on advanced technologies for digital education, blockchain, uh, AI, uh, augmented and virtual reality, those kind of things. And one of the things we I think everyone here probably learned very, very rapidly uh, in um, February, March 2020, was that we are probably, a lot of us, in quite a bubble with regard to digital education and that our understanding of what advanced technology means in terms of constant, like daily business usual, reliable use is not the same thing. 
as what actually is. So advanced technology for data allocation, it turns out in terms of software, infrastructure, familiarity and reliability, video calls, collaborative note taking, unmuting yourself, still a problem for all of us today after years. Uh, it's actually quite hard simply to, even if you're very familiar with technology, you're very comfortable with technology, it's actually quite hard to use in daily practice to use these online communication and uh, sharing tools, particularly for um, something sort of high stakes like teaching. And then in the actual concerns side, one of the things, so uh, I mean, I work at the OU, I don't teach at the OU, I'm not actually involved in the teaching, but even I was feeling quite sort of bombarded from the um, outside world of people we know and people in my networks and institutions who are sort of coming up saying, well, you lot have been doing distance learning for 50 years. It's hard, isn't it? I don't, like, this is really difficult. I'm not managing. I'm struggling with student engagement. I can't tell. My kids turn their cameras off. I'm staring at a wall of black squares. Are they paying me any attention? And even if they have the cameras on, really, I can't actually say who's engaged, whether it's face to face. Mm -hmm. uh, in a lecture hall, you can, you can generally tell that. Uh, how do we do assessment? This was a very, very major concern. In the video I moved to play earlier, this is a clip from Dorothy Fuglemeyer talking about uh, the potential for people to uh, cheat. Or be dishonest, I can't remember the exact word to use. Uh, this has been a major focus of how do you do exams when you come face to face. Uh, and these are things that while in our kind of bubble, as it were, or while those who've been working in and around specifically digital education in a, a everyday sense for a long time, um, we might think have been solved, but the question I think that comes up is, are they solved if they're not actually accessible? and uh, adaptable and usable and even our people, do people know about them. And so it sort of was quite a, a grounding experience, I suppose, to say, okay, yeah, uh, we've suddenly faced with a case where we're suddenly everyone has to use these things and we're finding out all the issues you get uh, when you go to a large number of users. So, um this is just informally so then the goal of the project was to, to find out about these things and uh determine what was going on so i i've stolen claudia's slide because i i just wanted to summarize our the things we had taken part um in to try and collect information about what was going on so uh particularly initially more uh surveys uh and as she said we could be pivoted uh interview expert interviews throughout the project uh, engaging with first we had multiple events webinars workshops and, and so on with lots of attendees we ran some we joined some we sat in on some just to uh take notes and join the discussion uh we collected projects initiatives if that number is higher now um i um and uh all these things to collect information so we've got both sources of um just data, tables of activities, tables of projects, tables of, of use cases, and so on, and analysis we can run on that, it's like using the model from the matrix that I was talking about earlier, uh, but also, and increasingly towards the latter half of the project, qualitative information about how people perceived the topic of best practice, how people uh, struggled to uh, determine best practice or to access um, best practices for digital and online education and uh those have been extremely <laughs> extremely insightful i think anyway. um so as a sort of summary of them so in terms of the sort of harder data so uh these are some of the statements that were um identified and presented in the research agenda uh about use cases for technology and education and these are quite um 
I think, forward looking, I suppose. So these are um, looking at things like how do we use games? How do we use chatbots? Uh, how do we use AR in labs? Um, or uh, in online teaching, can we recreate a face-to-face -face presence uh, using virtual reality? Um, these types of things, how do you handle fake certificates of blockchain and verify uh, certification being one very commonly proposed solution to that. And I can say I myself have also, also do work on it. Okay. Um, and group these according to the, so these we group these according to the three strategic priorities that have identified in the research agenda. So building a high quality ecosystem, reconstructing student experience and improving digital competencies. Um, and this is the thing I promised earlier, which I think is a, uh, quite illuminating thing that we got from an analysis of the uh, matrix data. So group, by grouping technologies by various uh, categories, so for example, blockchain, big data, AI, et cetera, um, digital education platform, things like our learning management system, things like Moodle, which might be familiar with, uh, sort of familiar with um, VR, et cetera. Uh, so what one of the things we were able to do is look at, well, what can we find out about the maturity of these different groupings of technology? What can we find about who's using these and uh, how much? Uh, and so, for example, so the different colors are for different, simply the types of organizations who are involved in them, whether it's an established institution, uh, an infrastructure provider, a uh, platform provider, research activity, uh, SMEs or startups. Um, and this gives a sort of sense of well, what's happening in each of these topics. So uh, AI is very, and blockchain are both very heavy on people producing platforms and they're both very on people doing research. Um, blockchain is slightly more for an infrastructure. Um, but uh, clearly the activity on plat and education platforms is much, much higher than everything else. Um, uh, across all fields, um, but not many SMEs, uh, not many established SMEs, as we would rather say, but quite a lot of startups. Uh, but in things like big data or AR, the and IoT, the interest is mostly in the SAC. These are relatively early things to be applied in um, this technology. I, and one can question these groupings at the bottom, and these were uh, manually derived, but uh, again, when we run this analysis, we the automatically derived groupings that we determine the uh, So that's, that's just a, a hint. I don't really believe in giving too much, going into very too much deep detail in uh, um, presentation, but there will be all the things that are in that will be in published the other books to see the, the depth of them. Um, but then I want to talk a little bit about the uh, qualitative findings. So what we discover through talking to people. And in particular, I, I meant to mention in the, um, when I was talking about the events we've done, I want to highlight the very recent um, set of Friday afternoon coffee chats we've been having, which I've thoroughly enjoyed and have been super illuminating um, uh, with all of our uh, lovely collaborators who have given me really great insights on things. Um, and across those, across the workshops we've taken part in and attended, and uh, various you know, mural boards and things that we've um, accumulated from these events. Uh, the main topic, really, when it comes, I would say the main thing that comes out of the quality of discussion is a very strong focus on the barriers, what, what is getting in people's way. Um, overall, um, I mean, I say that in a lot of ways, there's quite a strong sense of frustration with various elements of things and a sense, well, I'll come to it, but a sense of a disconnect. Uh, at the base level, and we're, I think, all highly aware of this, um, people simply find the, the maturity of technology. Uh, it, exactly how reliable is it? Uh, can, you, can you trust it when you need it? Can you make it do? The things that it promises to do. Uh, this has been a significant problem. Uh, infrastructure, in just internet connectivity, um, 
really make such a huge difference. Uh, but also access to um, access to software, access to hardware and tools that everyone can get at. I think these have caused problems, um, and they were known and established as problems before this. We, we knew these were difficulties, but of course, the scale has been given very much over to it. To it. On a more deeper level, and I'm not quite sure what to title this, but I'm going to go under philosophical assumptions. I think there's a sort of bit of a thing. We have a diversion for a different slide in a second, um, just because it's a pretty picture and I thought it was relevant. Um, of, I want to sort of talk about technological utopianism. Like, there's quite a common thing, and they're not just in education, and not I'm not pick, picking anyone out here, but there's quite a wide perception that well we just need more tech we can buy more toys and things will will be nicer or we just you know we we'll wait a bit for things to advance and it will solve these problems um you know at the the very extreme end you see well, i mean hopefully you don't see because it's not a very fun element of twitter to pay attention to but these uh tech bros boasting about selling pictures of apes with nfts uh, I'm talking about uh, Web 3.0 will fix everything by putting it all on the blockchain. And I like blockchain technology, and I think it's extremely useful. It's not going to make the world perfect. <laughs> it's just a tool. Um, and I think there's a, an element of this from certain perspectives in uh, educational technology, uh, particularly, I think, from and from what people are saying, coming from governmental levels. So you, there are a lot of, you know, you build initiatives like, oh, well, every child should have a tablet. And that's fine. That year, every child gets a new tablet. And then in the next two, three, four, five years, you have just a selection of old tablets that are not, get, not supported and are not being updated and not adapting to the needs of kids. And that's often how things are approached as well. Yeah, but okay, but tell us what technology to use. Uh, to tell us what, what will fix it. Tell us what will make it better. Um, and I have to say, we experience this within the project as well, of being, well, as, as Paul's recommended, so like, name us test on technology. And from this, so I want to get to the sort of main point, and a lot of people have uh, um, mentioned this sort of thing already, but overwhelmingly throughout all of our conversations, so much of the conversation was not about what the technology is or what it does or what it affords. It was about pedagogy. It was, okay, no, we have this technology. Don't know how to use it to teach effectively. I've tried doing my lectures on Zoom because I'm used to giving lectures as a teaching technique. Uh, it's not really feeling very comfortable. It doesn't seem to be working. It seems to be boring the students. Or it seems to be kind of very difficult to take things in. What do I do? Um, and that's been a recurring theme through all of our discussions is that actually broadly access to a lot of things is relatively widespread it's not necessarily reliable it's not necessarily universal infrastructure for it but in terms of technology and, and i mean that also in terms of tools and platforms and resources that's actually not that's difficult to get access to, but how to use these things effectively for digital teaching, a lot of traditional face-to-face -face educators and learners are not sure um, and can't necessarily find out very easily how. Um, and in line of that, or in connection to that, there's the concept of sharing and reuse. So we know, like, I mean, a lot of people here are quite involved in digital education, we know about this. We know there are good practices out there. We know there are resources you can take up and, and pick. We know there are um, high quality ones. And uh, we know there are ones that you are both technically and legally able to take and reuse, but it's not widely enough known and it's not easy enough. So, um, I mean, I was quite struck uh, earlier today um, with, uh, I 
I think Karen was talking about um, open educational resources. Uh, these, there's a lot of them, and there are a lot of very high quality ones for lots of different pedagogical needs and purposes and requirements, but not a lot. They're not as accessible to the bulk of the population as possible, and how to use them is not necessarily accessible to the bulk of the population as possible. Um, I'm going to put in a slight plug here for an old project of mine that um, I'm not saying this to sort of blow our own trumpet, but I think sort of anticipated some of these things. So it's an older project called Up to You, which was about uh, making a flexible infrastructure for pulling together different, different digital educational tools uh, to support pedagogical goals from within a certain framework. So we were focusing on project-based learning and flipped classroom approaches in secondary schools uh, to try and help um, kids have more of an experience of what university style learning is like. And one of the things that's always struck me in this as a, just a small thing and the platform we made, there was a hook into a repository of open educational resources that could be searched from within course creation, uh, within material creation, and were categorized by intended audience and so on, and could be taken and remixed, and the licenses were clear and they were pleased to remix them. The secondary school teachers who we worked with on this were so excited by it and got so creative and were doing such cool things with it. Um, because they hadn't really had access to that before. It's just a search engine that fits into your tools. And I know um, there will be different degrees of awareness and access to that, but it was a revelation to these um, secondary school teachers and they thought it was great. And it wasn't um, any sort of big deal to get them to take it and adopt it. Um, and I do think this is the sort of thing that needs to be more known about. People might just think, oh, well, we are, but you know, uh, are there that many of them? Is it, is it, are they good for what I need to do? And I find ones that are relevant to my context of teaching. Um, again, recurring theme in the things in terms of finding resources and finding the uses of the resources and the contextual best practice uh, people struggle with. Um, and then so I'm wrapping up, but uh, I think one of the biggest things that came out, I've mentioned it already, really, was this idea of a, of a policy disconnect. I spoke to people from all sorts of backgrounds and, and all sorts of different countries um, with different uh, COVID situations and different economic situations. And uh, repeatedly, there were quite a lot of things uh, talking about the issues they had with a disconnect with policy. They were facing needs and issues on the ground to find the best ways to do things with with technology, with digital learning, and that was not being reflected in the policy discussions or in the policy things that were being set. Even things like the very, very base level, bring your own device policies, are uh, the idea that you cannot, in a physical school, if you're going face to face, the idea that a child can't use their phone at school. And came up a number of times is that sort of thing really gets in the way. Um, because actually, if you want access to the infrastructure, more learners have more access to more up to date technology than institutions and they update it themselves. And not everyone can afford to do that. Digital divide is a real thing. But perhaps to give an example, if we took the money that was being spent on providing universal access to infrastructure to institutions and instead focus that money on people who couldn't afford uh, the technological solutions just at the infrastructure level, maybe that would be uh, useful. And to sort of generally try and summarize, I think, and this may seem pessimistic, I don't think it is, I think it's more optimistic, I think it's showing a way forward. I think really what came out from all of our qualitative findings was that we're not really asking the right questions when we're coming to this area. So we're not asking how do we connect pedagogy to technology? How do we go technology, how do we go technology last um, and pedagogy first? 
rather than saying, oh, well, technology first, right? If we just get right technology, that will fix it. Uh, how do we fix it? And how, more really importantly, how do we disseminate it? And how people can use it? And how do we connect policy to those things? Um, and I think if we, um, I think this is sort of my, my broad, <laughs> broad recommendation, which Jürgen is going to, um, talk about concrete policy recommendations, but overall I would say as a as a recommendation how we think about educational best practice, I think we have to sort of step back and look at the assumptions that different groups are making here and try and ad adopt that more flexibly and try and, and answer some of these issues that are coming up and go into the moment that um, so sort of, thank you. Thank you. So any questions? Thank you, Ashley. Uh, I also thank Georgios and Claudia for putting the links, uh, you know, informative links. And uh, Ashley, uh, you also, if you, uh, uh, you know, if you can, then please uh, direct towards the, you know, uh, some documents, the deliverables that are related to these activities, and please put it on, in the chat. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, then I will invite uh, our next speaker, a uh, very nice colleague, uh, Georgios Tubekins, who is a researcher at the Fraunhofer Institute of Applied Information Technology. And uh, he's going to talk about the policy recommendations, tackling challenges, challenges ahead and recommendations for a future policy agenda. Uh, Georgios, uh, the, screen, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, first, please, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. But I don't see it myself. So give me a second until I coordinate myself. So I hope I will. Um, so you see it in full screen mode? Yes, and Thank the first you. page. Wonderful, Amrita. Um, I will uh, have now a visual disconnect from uh, from you unfortunately so uh, i will come back to the questions once i see them and switch off my slides uh, a few words to myself george is because i'm with fraunhofer fit i'm here part of the digital education team which is um, comprising technical experts um, developing uh, blockchain solutions in education uh, it is uh, comprising the educational experts which uh, take uh, you have seen them even in the videos uh, in the um, uh, adult education part on specific uh, uh, knowledge uh, transfer. And my part probably can be described since I'm from my background an architect and I have worked 12 years in a university at the interface of uh, education um, between architects and also uh, ICT applications. Uh, mainly in the cultural domain, um, I'm considered to be the policy, probably the policy expert in our group. So the task of bringing now all these uh, dots together fell to me. And um, yeah, uh, that is how we tried now to bring all these individual insights that we got together uh, to give something as recommendations and uh, conclusions out of the project that we had now for 28 months, 24 months. So I hope now this works. Um, if, as you already have heard in the beginning, the project started with a scope uh, specifically to look at the impact, uh, adoption and impact of these emerging techno uh, digital technologies. We roughly can summarize them as uh, blockchain solutions, uh, artificial intelligence, probably in, uh, mainly in personalized learning, and of course, um, uh, these um, augmented or blended uh, reality, mixed reality approaches to, in the simulation uh, branches of education. So that was the initial uh, concept, and we heard already several times today that COVID was a big game changer the world looks different today and there was an interesting question put before on the panel and even uh, in the discussion uh, are we going really to a better or are we trying are we falling back and doing this the old mistakes or the old approaches again and in order to find out the, exactly these questions well we had you uh, and uh, that is my opportunity to thank all of you, the few that are here today, but uh, generally all the almost 100 experts that contributed, uh, mainly in individual uh, long interviews, 
uh, in uh, social gatherings uh, at small scale because we found out that that was uh, the best format, in fact, to dive deeper into the topics that were of interest to all of us. Now, when it comes to this main issue about resilience, uh, it is interesting to notice that uh, when we talk now about a more resilient education system, it is interesting and important to notice that the concept of resilience that is put forward by the Commission differs a little bit and it is much more expanded that probably is known from the education or the psychological domain. Because here, resilience is defined not only as an ability to withstand and to cope with challenges and adverse effects, which is a general um, a definition of resilience, but this included here with the notion of undergoing a kind of transition in a sustainable, fair and democratic manner. And this has been put forward um, uh, also, especially, of course, in light of the first year of the pandemic by the end of 2020 in the strategic foresight report of the Commission, which is in general addressing 10 strategic areas for the future in order to strengthen Europe's global positioning. Um, and uh, this basic notion here is, well, that uh, resilience is not only a technological, but probably more, even more a social uh, endeavor. And these two aspects have to be considered equally. So resilience is considered the new comp compass, um, which is um, more or less um, imbued through all policy making in the Commission. And so um, taking now also this transition aspect into the questions, um, we had now to try to make ourselves clear, well, what does it mean for our education sector? And for the domain of uh, education, uh, the Commission has set up goals, targets, uh, in the context of the European education area, uh, targets defined uh, in the course of 2020. And if you look here to the summary table, you might see that some targets, they, they do not diverge too much from the situation from now, um, which is basically an acknowledgement of the fact that nobody expects, even on policy level probably, that um, too, mu too much can be expected, uh, taking into consideration where we are currently. And this, um, European education area uh, vision um, basically is an idea to share policy, to share uh, uh, experiences, uh, to streamline cooperation within the uh, European Union uh, by sharing agreed targets and indicators and monitor this progress that we see here. And interesting enough, that is a try to harmonize timelines uh, with the larger fiscal spending of the Commission, because it is clear that improvements in education will require um, specific funding. And it is understood here that uh, this funding will have to come also from European sources. And uh, this is labeled the European semester process. So when you hear about the European semester process, it has, it has nothing to do with education in its core, but basically it's exactly the process to streamline, to harmonize timelines for, for major spending instruments within the Commission to have a more uh, equity in the spending of funds, especially in the context of this, um, um, these, uh, resilient, uh, these um, uh, new instruments the Commission has set up in the context of uh, um, fighting the COVID pandemic. So, uh, we have heard already several times today uh, about similar experiences that have been made in different educational domains, um, characterized by the rapid response to the crisis with many different approaches implemented, a quite broad variety even uh, that has been acknowledged even on several summary reports uh, by the European Parliament and by the Commission already. These different solutions were shaped mostly by local context and the broader, broader circumstances of um, individuals even and institutions. Uh, and uh, this on the one hand side has um, activated a lot of optimism. It has because new coalitions were suddenly possible. But uh, when we dig more deeper into the matter, we understood that most of the uh, almost all of 
the interviewed experts realized and felt a, dis a deep disconnect between policy targets, also policy approaches, and educa education practice on the ground. Um, some consolidated findings now that we heard already from before uh, can be summarized that the emergency turn uh, due to the COVID pandemic highlighted the need for technological tools and infrastructure, and of course, the need for supporting teaching and learning environments. Um, but it also, uh, well, that, that the sudden shift in this emergency, still emergency remote teaching mode, uh, does not necessarily has led to a further development or a better adoption of uh, emerging technologies, because we always had this strand of what is the impact of these specific emerging technologies. And the contrary, in fact, uh, we noticed that most of these so-called emerging technologies demanded so much um, technological um, context that they simply dropped out of attention for almost a year in several contexts. And it became evident that the needs for skills development for individuals, individuals and well as institutions um, is absolutely urgent in light that all the studies worldwide indicate that, um, well, not only the job, but entire society will be transformed by digital technology. In this context, the EdTech partners on several occasion, occasions highlighted the uh, barriers to entry to markets that they were quite high because um, acquisition mode, especially of public spending, um, too often uh, puts them aside, uh, although they would have to offer, uh, and they demonstrated during the pandemic, that they have interesting solutions to offer, uh, especially in niche markets or in niche uh, domains. And uh, this all has led, well, to a kind of necessity or a kind of understanding that higher education, because that maybe probably is a little bit biased by our expert, um, by the, uh, the larger uh, component of our expert group, has to be repositioned where, which, where it stands in a kind of lifelong learning cycle concept of learners. And um, all this summarized together from a little bit higher perspective, um, has emerged the desire for a kind of more local sovereignty of actors on a technical on the governance level uh, to decide on the solutions um, that they apply, that they can choose of. And this could be considered as a really sustainable resilience model for the future of education in Europe. Um, yes, of course, we have to mention uh, and Zoom fatigue kind of, uh, well, uh, euphemism, but it describes also the other part, the dark side of the, um, of the COVID uh, digitalization um, push, uh, because we had an absolutely uneven distribution of activities uh, when it comes to actors, because those who were in the meta, we can say, they had suddenly to face a high demand, they were extremely exposed. And uh, in fact, they have to see how they can cope uh, with their own resources um, because it definitely led to symptoms of stress, overwork, and exhaustion on both sides. Because uh, the tackling of the pandemic has resulted to be an individual uh, endeavor, individually by students, by teachers, and by uh, pupils and families somehow. And uh, this is being acknowledged already on a higher level because health institutions warn of strong indicators towards if that this cannot be the situation to continue because severe mental psychological problems are documented um, and uh, leading and we heard this already this morning acknowledged by the commission uh, to those who are not so marginal to the marginalized being marginalized even more and the central question of today, is it really now, are we going to bounce back? Or is it really possible to initiate a transformation in the sense of resilience and to emerge stronger 
out of the COVID pandemic. And that is the way how we tried now to put together all these pieces that we have found. We have heard about uh, something that came out as a novelty here that um, apart from the two priority areas, strategic priority areas, the Commission has already identified in its digital education plan, which is the need for a high quality digital ecosystem and the improvement of digital um, uh, skills. Um, we would add here the notion, really the notion, the importance to put essential focus on reconstructing as well the learner experience, because we learned today that uh, development of not only skills, but competencies, and that's in which direction I want to lead this now, require much more than a Zoom room. It, uh, because we learn, we heard today several times that learning is much more than solving uh, problems in class. Uh, it is the social experience, it is the community experience of learning. Uh, learning between the learner and the educator, and learning amongst peers. Uh, so this aspect has to become much more attention, probably in future strategic decisions. And it is absolutely clear that there is an interconnectedness in between these areas, which is even more um, becoming complicated if you take into account the complexity of the relationships in between uh these areas which as we heard as well today are in a continuous flux so there is change is a continuous aspect uh, there is no static in education summarizing this on a first stage for getting now a kind of analysis how to cope or how to derive recommendations out of this we take advantage of the uh, maturity model developed the European maturity model for blended education, which is considering that there is something like a micro level, a meso level and macro level of uh, notion or dealing, trying to deal with programs. The micro level is quite obvious. It is the relationship in the class between student and teacher on the level of instruction. And here we can say, of course, that, uh, well, we heard it today, adapting to the online learning, uh, the, the con or the, the, the um, uh, the concerns that uh, related to this level uh, is that adaptation to online learning raised well um, the the sense of being part of a community was probably uh, completely disrupted for a lot of students and uh, we, we mentioned the mental health part um, and because it it affected the students such a way that they really thought about themselves and affect my uh, career on a long term. But it affected as well teachers because they had to cope with the situation. Uh, it, challenged, it challenged as well their self understanding, their self efficacy, efficacy, and they say, well, are they, am I good enough uh, in online teaching as I am in the, in the traditional way? So these are really severe uh, concerns, and it is clear that alignments. Uh, in this context, ab absolutely necessary. Uh, and this is affecting the second level, which is the meso level, because learners, uh, students, and instructors, and teachers, they are embedded in courses and programs within institutions. And here, the, this meso level, um, oops, sorry, this meso level requires a better attention that the role of institution, the positioning of institutions has to take uh, care, has to be given more um, care, um, more um, integration as well, their ambitions to um, align a kind of digital or uh, blended education concepts also into stronger, uh, or a stronger institutional embedding um, and in order to have these quality measurements uh, in place, which align with the overall educational strategy of an edu um, institution. And a little bit larger than that, we have the macro level, which is considering the education system as a whole. And uh, we heard already here that the Commission is active quite a lot 
uh, in uh, trying to engage in stronger relationships in uh, in uh, promoting um, uh, harmonization or approaches best approaches we're trying to bring uh, stakeholder together and how this how we can translate now this into a roadmap so if we have the situation of today and the vision where we want to go it's absolutely clear that a vision is necessary to define the path into the future uh, we have heard today several times that connectivity and infrastructure deficits have to be tackled and they have to be tackled by member states by activating large funds and we heard here today that structural funds and the recovery and resilience funds probably are the instruments to 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 divert larger funds uh, from the Commission into member states in order to overcome infrastructure deficits, which are also related to solving major security aspects or security concerns that have been uh, raised and uh, tackled sometimes probably in a very provisional way today. But this is the starting point uh, from where we are. And we consider that and having heard even some comments of today, it is important to align the vision um, or to, to put the goals uh, in such a way that they're not only ambitions, but they contribute to a kind of common good. We have heard it today. What we mean by that? Skills, it is more than skills. Developing uh, capacities for the 20s first century demands something like competencies and the competencies it is about personal competence competencies it's about social social competence competencies and it's about the competency to learn learning because to be able to anticipate and to tackle really challenges in the future in 10 years to come that we are not aware uh, of today uh, we know about climate change, we know about uh, general uh, global um, uh, imbalances growing and we require people who have the abilities to tackle them. So this is a kind of more general uh, understanding in which developed, in which direction uh, skills or competencies have been to be developed. And we, and because all other aspects like well-being and equity basically are uh, dimensions of these common good aspects. And uh, we have already um, agendas which can be used for here. We have this uh, sustainable development goals, which quite explicitly mention the role of education in this context. And therefore we consider that on the macro level, it means tackling bottom up uh, or tackling the technological aspect and to combine it with a really clear vision in which direction we want to develop skills of young people from today, because in order to have them, of course, these skills, it is it is necessary to do the change management by today. Uh, so, and that is what it is required to have an uh, broad and integrated change management, which is aligned with broader visions, um, promoted, and even funded uh, by policy support. And here, blended education should become part within institutional strategy and directly related to the quality management principles, which also are applied to general uh, educational uh, progress, educational monitoring. Um, so not to extract it as a kind of special component, but to make it an integrated part. And for that, cu uh, curricular alignments are necessary to align here clearly with um, objectives on a broader scale. And uh, this requires leadership. Um, it, re it requires leadership for two reasons, in order to initiate such a process within institutions, but also to relieve the stress for individuals to have to find uh, solutions on an individual level. I'm not sure if this is readable to you. That's why I'm trying to read this out in parts. And it, here, of course, it comes also to the part of measuring indicators on this institutional level. I've mentioned here specifically the selfie tool, but the selfie, because it is promoted by the Commission, but the selfie tool is only one uh, among more than 30 
uh, which are available on the market for different um, uh, with different scope. Uh, and uh, I've put, put it already in the chat. Uh, it is a very valuable resource, this report by the European Union of Universities, in which way these type of assessment tools can help um, to initiate and also to measure such a change management vision. And uh, yes, on the other side, I've put here what we have heard here already several uh, parts today. Um, the ambitious goal by the Commission by 2025 to have the um, dig digital uh, education area, the targets achieved. And here the, uh, there, is the, there exists this uh, digital competence uh, model, a schedule model um, with a set of uh, digital skills, which are considered to be the basic skills. But we heard already today in uh, one of the videos that uh, startups come up with skill models, which comprise several thousands of skill aspects, which are related to the job market. So this is a kind of really uh, uh, the bottom or the, the a very basic, but I think helpful um, uh, initiative, the DigiComp initiative, the European Digital Competence Framework, uh, to, st to have a kind of basic uh, um, benchmark uh, what digital scan, uh, skills can be and what we learned in the context of the project where emerging technologies can really have a beneficial aspect here is to introduce such an European digital skills certificate, which is advocated by the Commission with a public education blockchain uh, run by the Commission or run uh, on behalf of the Commission uh, for Europe in which these certificates can be securely stored. So what I want to make here that on the MESO level, in order to have the MESO level properly function, it requires a clear set of targets, a clear set of policy goals on the one hand side, uh, along which these um, uh, um, policies then can be aligned uh, in order to overcome exactly what we have mentioned today, because it is exactly the gap that we have currently experiencing, the gap between policy and practice. And that is my last contribution here today. That is the point where we can make, where, we can, where it really can bring in the change on the micro level. We try to, to fill here the gap um, in three domains, uh, putting more emphasis on learning design for the digital age, more emphasis on interoperability of creative tools and also of, about creative content. And it is absolutely necessary to bring new solutions when it comes now to personalized personalized learning uh, into a clear uh, relation with ethical considerations and who is let's end who is finally doing decisions on the learning uh, progress is it the algorithm is it the learner or it and therefore to have a clear approach how to treat algorithm in education um, more sustainably we can say in order to be able to maintain them, in order to be able to understand the learning result better. Um, I'm now a little bit over my time. Um, and that we identified within the projects or within the activities that we scanned interesting, very interesting uh, contributions into how mixed reality um, solutions can provide uh, really um, a seamless integration, almost we can say, about a workplace reality uh, and uh, um, support, knowledge support through um, mixed uh, or augmented reality, uh, reality solutions. We have seen technological proposals which can ensure interoperability uh, across a multitude of learning platforms already by today. So these solutions exist. And we are absolutely convinced that it is necessary to link such uh, research on uh, emergent and advanced technology to learning practice. And this means that the new focus has to be put on really the learning design that is what we mentioned before by reconstructing the learners' experiences. So really to think about the craft which is dedicating to create, to produce, to evaluate, and 
at the end to improve the resources and the experiences for people, learners, organizations to perform better. And therefore, it is absolutely important that learning design introduces and tackles the larger why questions. Why we do all these? Where do we want to go uh, with what we learn here? And um, that is basically our try, our contribution at the end of the project. We call this Steps Towards Resilience, a roadmap toward digital transformation education. And I would be, that's the first time that we present this to the public and it would be very much interesting to uh, receive some of your responses on this. Unfortunately, it's only the chat available, so there is no visual and, or no uh, direct communication possible, but probably or maybe the chat might serve here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgios. A very, very intense uh, and uh, very informative presentation. And also thank you for all the work that you have done on the policy recommendation document. And uh, what I request is that you can, uh, you know, if you don't mind, then you can put your contact on the live chat. So if people want to get back to you personally, uh, they can do that. They have the possibility to do that. Uh, uh, if there are no questions, uh, are there any questions from anybody? Then uh, we wait a couple of minutes. Uh, can you provide highlights on the recommendations on blended learning? Can you provide highlights on recommendations on blended learning? Yes. Hello? 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 Does anybody hear me? Ashley, we hear you. You. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, okay. There was a thank you so much. There was a question, Georgios, for you uh, from Professor Ramchandran. Can you provide highlights on the recommendations on blended learning? Uh, highlights, uh, unfortunately, Rama, can well um, highlights in the sense well we, there we encountered or during doing review on existing um, recommendations. Yes, there is a, there is a set of reports. I would say that are absolutely interesting to read. Uh, they will be part of the literature list of uh, uh, of uh, the of the final deliverable. And uh, uh, what I can highlight is the um, there is the working group on uh, on global level, uh, the ICT summit. And uh, the ICT summit has since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the ICT summit on education, and they have since the beginning of the pandemic issued several um, uh, overview reports uh, on um, assessment and also in which direction um, uh, improvements can be developed on especially these three levels. They concentrate basically on the first two, on the micro and the meso level, because they are uh, collecting experiences from their uh, community of experts, uh, but on a global level. And that's interesting because here we have sometimes, of course, a very reduced view on Europe. And uh, if, we, uh, if we expand this a little bit, our view, we had these experiences during a conference with a more global attendance, then some of the um, more fundamental uh, aspects of connectivity, of course, in some other parts of the world are much more um, pressing than even with us. So the ICT summit on education is a very good starting point uh, where you can uh, find um, uh, beyond the recommendations that we are going to put into our final report. Sorry, I'm, am I visible? Because my camera somehow has uh, kicked me off, I think. You are visible, uh, Georgios, but uh, I think you're still uh, sharing your screen. So maybe if you turn the three dots and stop sharing, then it will oh, be sorry. Better. no problem at all. Thank you so much. And I hope it answers uh, uh, Professor Ramchandran's question. He says, thank you. Yes. Uh, so thank you, Georgios. If there are no more questions, then I would like to invite uh, finally uh, our last speaker and uh, 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 my colleague, Dr. Giovanni Rumasa, coordinator of the project to, to uh, close and close the event and give a wrap up of uh, you know the today's uh, presentations and discussions
thank you, Amarita, and thanks uh, all the, to all the speakers also of the second session. Give me a second that I am going to share my, <clears throat> my presentation where I try to sum up <clears throat> A little bit uh, what I mean the, the path that we follow during this uh, during this uh, event. Okay, can you see my full screen uh, presentation now? It should show the agenda with the last uh, slot, which is exactly the closing summing summing up of the of the of the day. Can you see it? So I assume you can, right? Yes. Okay, well, I'm going on. If there are problems, let me know. So this is just a repeat of the uh, opening slide where I sketched the overall general goal of, of Del for All and how it relates with digital transformation that is a major European and global, uh, let's say, mega trend and necessity <clears throat> from an economical and social point of view that goes much beyond education, but this is where we fit. And uh, so we started with the keynote this morning, uh, and uh, that again showed that the digital transformation is the overall journey, that the education uh, industry and overall uh, system is, is, uh, is on. But this goes uh, much wider than uh, digital enhanced learning and much wider than education, but it affects the whole of society. And uh, I put, green transformation in, in brackets because we know that actually the digitalization and the uh, overall uh, environmental impact are now uh, by now intertwined given the, the importance of IT technologies and, uh, and systems for the whole of, uh, of global modern society. And uh, everybody talked of course about the pandemic and uh, the pandemic has been shown to have accelerated things, to have also reset priorities and to have forced uh, a lot of people, including the, the Del for All uh, partners, to redefine what it was meant by technology support, what is meant by uh, learning context, what is meant by interaction between technology and, and uh, pedagogical and educational goals. So it is true that these all these things are wider than, than the, 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 the project or program scope of digital education, but there is also a lot of demand and evidence that we have heard from the Commission. We have seen it in the panel. We also have seen it in the last presentation about the policy recommendation and the research agenda that uh, digital education is still key, even when placed in this wider context, because uh, it has to provide some help for the for the skill gap that is still expected to last in terms of general population digital skill. It is also supposed to help balancing the need for growth development and quick adoption of digital technologies and, uh, and tools with the uh, European values, including uh, fairness, accessibility, inclusiveness, and to uh, cope with the digital divide, which is not just a matter of skill, but also of infrastructure, economic condition, and general, let's say, um, quality of life uh, for our European and global citizens. And then lastly, uh, we heard about the concrete steps uh, that the Commission is taking in this area, and they can be um, uh, quickly uh, summarized uh, in two, uh, in two um, policy actions. One is the Digital Education Action Plan that we have heard mentioned again throughout the day, and uh, that defined priorities and actions uh, in terms of digital education, and has been uh, revised in 20, late 2020 after the first uh, big wave of the pandemic to include uh, the first uh, uh, ex expanded mentions of resilience as a way of responding to pandemics, but also to crisis in more in general. And the second one is a digital decade, which is again, not particularly about the digital um, education, but it has uh, uh, aspects in the compass that again point out to the digital skills and to digital infrastructure that can both be the reason for digital divide across uh, European citizens. 
And then, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, we got some, uh, let's say, uh, sneak peek and, and, um, and information about the next steps in terms of funding and support uh, that the Commission has set up in uh, the area of EdTech, like this uh, already open uh, Digital Europe uh, program call. Then we continued, uh, let's say, with the big picture, if you want, uh, in the panel. And again, it uh, would be, I mean, a too hard a task for me to uh, to summarize the various trends, uh, threads of discussion that we that we heard during the panel. But a few things that uh, I think we we might have noticed is that uh, the panel was diverse, like the topics, also the expertise, and and uh, I would say that the, the stance, the perspective of each individual panelist was. Uh, was uh, unique and uh, I also take the chance to uh, thank and uh, and um, underline the, the, the weaving role that uh, the, our colleague Alex Gresh as the, as the moderator did in this panel. And again, uh, the pandemic was a major factor, but uh, technology is a tool, is an enabler, is something that can uh, make the difference, but is never the end uh, of, uh, is never the goal, but it is uh, um, to be, to, to, to facilitate things that depend on the specific dynamics of learning. And uh, even these dynamics of learning is not to be defined against some so sort of uh, static backdrop of what is right and how does uh, one learn or one, what is uh, the, the expected result of a successful learning process. But again, even all these are moving uh, goals and this is all um, um, continuously changing and evolving system that uh, we have to track in this, uh, in this uh, digital education uh, plans. And uh, again, uh, this, this, this dynamic uh, and changing uh, situation was highlighted in the panel because there have been quite uh, some discussion about uh, the transition to lifelong learning, uh, how to um, avoid this idea that a degree is somehow of a permanent achievement, uh, whereas uh, other ways of learning are underrepresented or are under-recognized, so that this opens the, all the the potential for interoperable certifications and technologically uh, portable European wide uh, certification system that cross through traditional uh, learning institution, but include also um, newer, newer operators. And again, how to um, develop digital skills uh, under this constantly changing uh, uh, process. This uh, first part, let's say, set the scene and got us already an interesting catalog of, uh, of topics. And then we um, concentrated a little bit more on the specific outputs of Del for All, with the, the understanding that Del for All by nature was, um, so was started as, as a coordination action. So all, when I say things like the project's results are actually the results of the community and the project worked as a facilitator and as an aggregator for uh, people uh, to come together, exchange ideas and give us their insights that we can then uh, um, organize and, and propagate like we are doing in this, in this event and with the upcoming uh, final deliverables that we will present. So uh, already this morning, I said that there are three objectives and these three objectives they created uh, beyond the community aspect, they created four uh, um, results. So here I have uh, the uh, quick summary of the four presentations that we have just had that were uh, concentrating on the, on the four project results. One is about uh, the um, connection between education practice, education context and technology. So we got a little bit with, with uh, our colleague Ashling more in detail about how do we really map these two things and how do we use this as a model of understanding and not only uh, of uh, uh, presenting again, so the risk would be to present some static mapping that would not uh, track the, the, the constant evolution of these things. In the uh, research agenda with our colleague uh, Claudia, we then uh, uh, 
showed both the, how we did it and what were the conclusion of our uh, um, quest to interrogate the community for uh, what are the challenges, what are the topics of future research in the, in the digital education uh, and digital enhanced learning topics. And also here in the methodological part, I think was very interesting to see how the very way that we were collecting data and trying to make sense out of this data had to be adapted to the changing condition because people were interested in different arguments in different topics and then also the way that they wanted to interact change so we moved towards smaller workshop in-depth discussion different kind of service different kind of data analysis then again with with uh, ashling we uh, discussed this uh, best practice uh, idea which is the, i agree i mean uh, with the fact that sometimes the best practice uh, uh, can be used as a, as a blunt instrument and can be used as a as a um, uh, oversimplified way of helping people to improve in their in their discipline and especially again after after the the paradigm change in education due to the the, the consequences of the of the pandemic uh, it would have been um, uh, not uh, appropriate to try to present a catalog of best practices, even though we gathered uh, many experiences from different projects that, that we have analyzed. Uh, so again, we chose to go for a more dynamic approach where we try to give uh, guidelines and uh, uh, boundary conditions that help people find, assess, and adopt uh, their best practices. And uh, also with a little bit of, uh, let's say, self-awareness moment where we also uh, wondered about this uh, uh, solutionism or, or technological uh, utopia that sometimes is an easy trap to fall for people that are engaged to, uh, to um, directly with, with technology. Last but not least, uh, with our colleague Georgios, we finished, uh, um, let's say, taking all these strengths together to try to find out what kind of output we would have for uh, uh, the European Commission and all the interested stakeholders in terms of uh, policy needs, uh, perception of the community about uh, how the, the, the current policies match the, the practical needs of their, of their um, everyday activities. And uh, again, uh, try to uh, avoid blanket statement, but uh, add context with the levels and uh, specific context that we, we think applies to each of the recommendation. This last uh, um, point I want to highlight particularly because while for the other three presentations you already have uh, uh, public uh, project deliverables and previous discussions that you can go in and fetch from our website, the final deliverable report on the uh, policy recommendation is currently being written and will be finalized later. So please stay tuned because we will advertise it and it will be available on the website as soon as it is uh, publication ready. Good. So we come into a close of this uh, final event. So what is left? Uh, I think. Uh, I mean, we named this connecting the dots because we, we knew that the, the, the story as it happened is different than the story as everybody was expecting. And this has been already mentioned by, by most of us during, during today. And so I was thinking, okay, uh, the, name, the, the, the name itself of Del For All uh, is something that uh, proved itself surprisingly resilient because even though the original uh, view and focus of the project changed uh, relatively, I mean, uh, system substantially. It is still true that uh, this project was never technology first, uh, but uh, was always about uh, learning first and uh, the um, uh, role of technology in, 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 improving, in improving and facilitating that. We started with a vision of a few advanced technologies, then we had to redefine this as, as you heard in several of our presentation, but this is still true that we try to get a learning first and bottom up and community first approach. And the other part is the for all, this also I think stays because uh, throughout uh, the, this whole event from the commission, from our panelists and from the presentations of our, from our colleagues, 
we have uh, seen how important the community fairness and uh, and um, uh, inclusiveness aspects are for a domain like uh, uh, education and learning which is all about uh, kickstarting the, um, the 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 uh, future prospect of, of learners, never mind in which stage of their life they are, one learns because he wants to become something that uh, they, they think it is, uh, it is desirable to be, to be desirable to become. So that's it. Uh, the next steps uh, for us are that we will uh, continue to propagate and integrate the results that we obtain, finish publishing, of course, the, the, the last deliverables like, uh, like the policy recommendation and develop the, the community further. So all the channels that you know and have been mentioned in the, in the chat are there and uh, please uh, contact us if you want to know more or if you have uh, experience uh, contribution to make uh, events that you think are relevant for us these uh, all these all these channels stay open but is also important for uh, the project i think to be true to the connection and coordination nature of, of this kind of projects that we know that we are a thread in a larger in a larger tapestry of uh, all these uh, these uh, macro trends that we have discussed between education digital transformation twin transformation and the ongoing uh, programs uh, at european and global level in in uh, technology for education so I want to thank again and stop in sharing now. And so maybe we can again go back with, very good. So I would like to thank uh, all the participants and the speakers and all the colleagues of the consortium. And uh, I, unless there are further questions, I can just uh, uh, finish with again, uh, my best wishes for today and for your uh, role, for your thread in the tapestry of digital education. And uh, uh, please stay tuned, look at on, on our uh, communication channels and on the project website for the next updates. Mm -hmm.